My name is Eli Bennett, and this happened to me in September 2016. I'm a National Park Ranger, and have been for as long as I can remember. My dad was a ranger, and his dad before him, and it was all I ever wanted to be. Guess some things are in the blood. I work in Olympic National Park. Beautiful place, all rainforests and rugged mountains, but even the most stunning scenery can hold dark secrets. September is elk rutting season. Makes for spectacular wildlife spotting, but also dangerous. Big bull elk, pumped up on hormones, they'll charge a Volkswagen if they think it stole their girl. Always got to watch those tourists. Some think the whole park is a Disneyland ride, that the animals are trained to be photo props. This particular morning, I was dealing with a family trying to take selfies with a particularly agitated bull elk. Finally got them back in their car and headed out to check one of the backcountry trails, when the radio call came in. It was dispatch, voice tight. Not another lost hiker or mountain bike accident, please. But this was different. Multiple park visitors missing, the dispatcher said, words clipped. Since early this morning. Last known location, south end of the whole rainforest trail. Well, that's not good. The whole rainforest is dense, old-growth trees with canopies so thick they blot out the sky. Easy to get turned around there. But this was more than folks losing the trail. It felt wrong. That prickle at the back of my neck again. I headed for the trailhead, lights flashing. A couple other rangers had already arrived, faces grim. One was an older woman, Anya, ex-military with nerves of steel. The other, Josh. Well, let's just say he was still fresh out of the academy, more used to writing parking tickets than whatever this was going to be. The missing folks were two men and a woman, experienced hikers according to their backcountry permit. That was something, at least. Anya started interviewing their friend, the one who made the call trying to get a clearer picture of where they might have gone. I took Josh aside. Look, kid, this ain't going to be some lost puppy rescue. Stay sharp, do what I say, and keep your wits about you. I told him. Honestly, I was half hoping to scare him off, get him transferred somewhere safer. But Josh just nodded, face pale but determined. Guess he had some grit in him after all. Dispatch came through with another update. A group of day hikers heard screams further down the trail, hours ago. Anya swore, low and harsh. Okay, now it felt like we were walking into a trap. We moved out, deeper into the rainforest. Sunlight barely filters through the leaves here, everything damp and shrouded in a perpetual green gloom. The air thrummed with insects, the smell of wet earth almost overpowering. Josh coughed and said, Kinda creepy, isn't it? You ain't seen nothing yet, I muttered. We found their abandoned campsite about an hour in. Gear tossed everywhere, like they left in a hurry. Worse, blood splatters on a torn sleeping bag. I held up a closed fist, signaling Anya and Josh to halt. The prickle on my neck had intensified, the sense of wrongness almost suffocating. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves, felt like something closing in. That's when I saw the first footprint. It was massive, easily double the size of any man's foot I'd ever seen. Toes were too long, splayed out wide, and the claws, those claws sunk deep into the mud. There were more prints leading deeper into the trees. What the hell? Josh whispered, his voice shaking. I don't know, I admitted, feeling my stomach clench. It was time for plain talk. This ain't some bear, folks. Whatever did this, it's something new, or at least something I ain't never encountered before. Anya was staring at the ground, 
muttering something in Russian I didn't catch. When she looked up, her face was set in a mask of grim determination. There's old legends up here, she said, her voice low. Stories the whole tribe used to tell. I think... She took a deep breath. I think we're about to see one of those stories come to life. The way she said it. I knew she wasn't talking fairy tales. We loaded our rifles, checked our sidearms, and followed those monstrous tracks into the heart of the wilderness. Something was out here, something brutal and hungry. The rainforest always held an air of mystery, but today that mystery felt laced with malice. Every so often we'd find a blood trail, or signs of a struggle a shredded backpack. A bent hiking pole snapped like a twig. What we didn't find were bodies. Whatever this creature was, it wasn't just leaving its victims to die. It was taking them. The sun was low by the time we began hearing it. Sounds carry strange in the forest, echoing and deceptive. At first, it was a mournful wail, like a wolf, but distorted somehow, stretched too long. Then came a snapping, crashing noise tree branches splintering against something massive. Stay together, I hissed to Anya and Josh. I gripped my rifle with white-knuckled hands, feeling adrenaline spike through my veins. Whatever this thing was, I knew one thing for sure. We were no longer the hunters. We were the prey. We rounded a bend in the overgrown trail. For a moment... The trees ahead seemed to sway and heave, then something stepped out into view. I won't forget that first sight, not if I lived to be a hundred. It was the size of a grizzly, hunched forward on overlong limbs, but that's where any resemblance to nature ended. Its skin clung tight to its ribs, sickly pale, hairless in patches. Its head, it was like a human skull pulled out of proportion— a mouth unnaturally wide, filled with rows of jagged teeth. Its eyes, those were the worst. Small, black, they glittered with a terrible, calculating intelligence. It let out another of those wails, sending chills down my spine. And that's when it saw us. In that moment I knew. This was the thing, the source of all those old stories I thought were campfire tales. This was the thing whispered about, the thing that takes and is never seen again. The creature lunged, its speed shocking against its lumbering appearance. Josh screamed and stumbled back, firing his rifle in a panic. The shots hit, I saw the creature jerk, but it barely seemed to slow down. It crashed into Josh, hurling him to the ground with a sickening thud. I heard bone break and then Josh was gone swallowed into the undergrowth behind the charging beast. Josh! Anya yelled, her rifle barking. She managed to drive it back, and blood spattered the leaves, but not enough. It was too tough, too fast, and it was already circling around for another attack. That's when I saw the cave. A narrow opening in the roots of an ancient cedar— half hidden by ferns. Anya, the cave, get to cover! I shouted just as the creature charged again. Anya, thank God, listened. She sprinted towards the opening, diving in at the last possible second. The creature, focused on her, barreled past. Its claws raked the ground where she'd been moments before. Then it turned back, snarling. I fired shot after shot, aiming for those hellish eyes, but it seemed barely affected. I kept firing, more to buy time than do any real damage. The clicking of my empty magazine was the loudest sound in the world. This was it. Ammo gone, Anya trapped, and that thing waiting right in front of me. I tossed the useless rifle aside and drew my pistol. Not much but it was all I had left. The creature crouched low, muscles tensing like coiled springs. With a screech, it lunged again. 
I closed my eyes, fingers squeezing the trigger. Then, an explosion of noise, a shotgun blast, so close my ears rang. The creature shrieked, twisting midair, and crashed to the ground a few feet from me. Blinded, I stumbled back, tripping over a root, expecting the killing blow any second. But it didn't come. I cracked open an eye. The creature was thrashing, but something was pinning it down. My vision cleared and I saw Anya standing over it, the smoking shotgun clutched in her hands. But what held the creature to the ground? It was Josh. He was on its back, clinging for dear life. His clothes were in tatters, one leg twisted at an impossible angle, and blood streamed from a savage scratch across his face. Yet, in his hand was my discarded rifle, and he jammed the barrel into the monster's ruined eye socket. The creature bucked and shrieked, its strength impossible, but Josh held on, driven by desperation. Shoot! He choked out. Shoot it again! That snapped me out of my shock. I scrambled up, aiming my pistol with trembling hands. I squeezed the trigger over and over, putting round after round into the creature's skull. Finally, its thrashing slowed, then stopped. It lay still, a grotesque corpse amongst the ferns. Silence fell, broken only by our ragged breathing. I looked at Josh, lying on that thing's back, and a wave of guilt and gratitude washed over me. I'd ridden him off, and he just saved my life. Anya moved slowly toward him, tears streaming down her face. She gently peeled his hands from the rifle, and then he slumped, unconscious. We got him stabilized as best we could, Anya radioing for an emergency airlift as I tried to stop the worst of the bleeding. All the while, I kept staring at the creature's body. Whatever it was, it wasn't an animal, not holy. Under that hide was a warped framework of bone like someone took half-remembered pieces and stuck them together in a grotesque mockery of life. What made that thing, and how many more were out there? The thought made me sick. The chopper arrived with the fading light. Park medics loaded Josh in, then Anya, who refused to leave his side. Before I climbed aboard, I took one last look at the clearing. The creature's body was already being consumed by the rainforest. Insects buzzed, vines snaked towards it. A carpet of moss began creeping across its skin. In a few days, there'd be no trace, nothing for backup rangers to find but torn up ground and some half-believed story from a traumatized survivor. Aftermath, Josh didn't make it. He pulled through surgery, but then complications, infection... He was gone a few weeks later. Anya never came back to the park service, took an early retirement, and disappeared from what I heard. My report? Well, bear attack, of course. What else could I say? That we encountered some monster from a campfire story and lived only by sheer luck? They'd have locked me up in a padded room. Officially, it's like that day never happened. Josh is a name on a plaque, a ranger who died in the line of duty. The creature? Just a figment of my grief-stricken imagination. That might be easier to live with if I believed it. But I don't. Sometimes, on patrol deep in the forest, I swear I feel eyes on me. Sometimes, I hear that mournful wail echoing through the trees, and I have to fight the urge to run, to hide. Sometimes I wake in a cold sweat and the air crackles with a sense of wrongness that clings to me for days afterwards. And there's one more thing. A few months after that incident, we found another body deep in the rainforest. Not a hiker this was older. Bones half buried under the roots of an ancient tree, picked clean by scavengers. The anthropologist they brought in was baffled said it didn't fit any creature known to walk this earth. I didn't correct him. 
Sometimes I wonder if they're more out there, those things. Maybe they've always been out there, hidden in the deepest shadows, preying on whoever strays too far, too deep. Maybe the stories were true all along, and the horror isn't something new. It's as old as the forest itself. All I know for sure is this. The wilderness ain't the safe haven some folks think. There's teeth in those woods, claws, and eyes that watch from the darkness. And if you ain't careful, if you don't believe in monsters, they'll make a believer out of you yet. Okay, listen, I gotta tell you this. Last summer, I went on this solo backcountry trek through the Ozarks. My buddy, Cade Bryson, was supposed to come, but he bailed last minute. I should have known better, that flaky jerk. Anyway, I'm the type that needs to get out of the city now and again, breathe a little fresh air, you know? Always have been. First day, it's all good. Hiked a good ten miles, saw the best dang sunset of my life. Set up camp near this little creek, cooked myself some grub, did the whole outdoors a thing. It's my second night that gets weird. See, I always sleep with the rain fly just half on, kinda like looking up at the stars. So, I'm half dreaming, feeling this icy chill, not a breeze, mind you, a localized chill like something cold is right next to me. I opened my eyes, and let me tell you, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Just outside the tent, maybe two feet away, is this thing. Tall, easily seven feet, but hunched over like its bones are too long for its skin. Its head, I can't even describe it properly. Big and flat, like someone had stepped on a pumpkin with these beady eyes sunk way back under a bony ridge. But the worst part was the skin. Pallid, stretched tight across its frame, almost translucent, like you could see every sinew and vein underneath. This thing was just wrong, like something out of a nightmare. I froze, hardly daring to breathe. It tilted its head, and I swear those eyes were looking right at me. It sniffed the air, this wet, raspy sound that made my stomach turn, and for a heart-stopping second, I thought it was gonna come right into the tent. Instead, it let out this whistling shriek, a sound that cut through the night like a rusty knife. It startled the hell out of me, and I must have jerked or something, because it took a shuffling step back, then turned and bolted into the woods, disappearing like a damn ghost. I lay there, shaking in my sleeping bag, trying to convince myself it was just a dream. But I knew it wasn't. The next morning, I found footprints. Huge, misshapen things, nothing like any animal I'd ever seen. That's when I knew I had to get out of there. I'd packed up faster than I ever thought possible, heart pounding the whole time, imagining that freak creeping around the trees, watching me. Now I spent the rest of that trip constantly glancing over my shoulder. Never slept right. Kept expecting to see that pale face peering at me from the darkness, to hear that inhuman shriek again. Finally, I hightailed it back to my truck a day early, cutting the trip short. I didn't care. The weirdest thing is, no one believed me. I showed them pictures of the footprints, told them about the thing and they all just gave me this pitying look, like I'd gone nuts out in the woods. Even Cade, when I finally got hold of him, just laughed it off, said I probably saw a deformed deer or something. Makes you start to question yourself a bit. But that didn't make the memory of it go away. See, it wasn't just the way the thing looked, it was that feeling of wrongness, of something straight up unnatural being just inches from me. That feeling is still there, a prickle at the back of my mind. I haven't been back to the Ozarks since. Hell, I barely sleep out in the backyard anymore. Couple of weeks ago, 
I was scrolling those missing person websites, the ones with blurry photos of folks who vanished on hikes. Guess what I saw? A report from near where I'd been camping, way up in the backcountry. Guy named Elisa Esquera, experienced outdoorsman, just disappeared. No trace. I looked at that picture, at his dark, serious face, and I just knew. Whatever took him, it was the same thing I saw that night. Maybe he wasn't so lucky. I started doing some digging, and you wouldn't believe the amount of old Ozark legends there are whispering about weird creatures lurking in those woods. Tall, spindly things, pale as death, snatching people out of the dark, things the old-timers used to call hide-behinds. Makes a chill run down your spine, doesn't it? So here's the thing. I told myself I wouldn't go back. But there's this nagging part of me that just won't shut up. On one hand, I'm scared as hell of seeing that thing again, or worse, becoming another blurry missing person's photo. But on the other hand, if there's even a sliver of a chance of stopping that thing, of finding out what the hell it is or getting some shred of proof, hell, I might just have to give that trail another go. Problem is, I can't do it alone. Not again. And you wouldn't believe the looks I get when I start talking about hide-behinds to folks. So that's where I'm at now, stuck. I get this panicked feeling rising, like I'm out of time. I hear a rustling outside. It's probably just a squirrel. But that sense of dread is back, that feeling of eyes on me. I grab my flashlight, heart beating like a drum, and flick the beam out into the darkness. For a split second, I think I see a flash of sickly white skin, something slithering behind my tool shed. I stand there, flashlight beam trembling, but there's nothing but shadows behind the shed. I lower the light, take a deep breath, and force myself to start thinking clearly. Whatever that thing is, it's gone for now. Logic says I should pack up and drive home, tell myself I'm crazy, forget this whole thing. But I can't. I think about Ulysses, and something hardens inside me. The next couple of days are a blur. I get myself a shotgun, you know, the kind you see in the movies, the one that makes that satisfying chunk-chunk sound when you load it. Some ammo, a better flashlight, stuff I didn't think I'd ever need back in the city. I find an old army buddy, Marcus, who owes me a big favor. He doesn't question too much when I tell him I'm going back into those woods, just fixes me with that steady ex-military stare and says he's got my back. We head back to the Ozarks, set up camp at my old spot. Marcus swears I'm nuts, but he helps me rig some motion-activated cameras around the perimeter. The rest of that first day is excruciating. Waiting, knowing every rustle of leaves and snap of a twig could be it. Marcus is on edge, but he's not seeing what I saw, doesn't have that feeling crawling on his skin. I start to doubt myself, questioning if I actually saw anything real out there at all. Night falls. We eat a tense dinner by the fire, Marcus trying to crack jokes while I can't seem to swallow. It's when we're washing up the dishes that it happens. The motion cameras start flashing like crazy, and I hear that terrible, whistling shriek again, louder this time, closer. Marcus and I exchange a look, pure terror mixed with grim determination. We both grab guns, scanning the woods with our flashlights. Then we see it. The thing steps out from the trees, not ten feet from our camp. Its eyes shine in the light, those awful, hollow eyes filled with a predatory hunger. It hisses, bearing long, yellow teeth, spittle dripping from its inhuman mouth. Sweet baby Jesus. Marcus breathes out, his voice barely a whisper. Remember what we talked about? I tell him, trying to keep my own voice steady. We agreed, gotta aim for the head, that's the only shot we might have. 
The thing starts to circle us, moving impossibly fast. Marcus and I, back to back, rotate with it, trying to keep it in our sights. It bobs and weaves, impossibly agile for something of its size. Suddenly it lunges toward Marcus. I fire on instinct, the shotgun blast roaring in the still night air. Buckshot tears into the thing, and it emits a shriek that sounds like a human scream cut short. It stumbles, and I see a bloom of blood, no, some kind of dark ichor, splattering the trees. Damn, I didn't hit the head. The thing turns toward me, rage twisting its mangled features. It's wounded, but still dangerous. It charges, and I fire again and again. The recoil slams against my shoulder, and the air is thick with gunpowder and that sickly sweet, metallic smell. I see more of that black blood flying and then, darkness. It collapses just a couple feet in front of me, its shuddering body finally going still. Marcus and I stare down at it in the mingled flashlight beams. It's dead, and in the harsh light, we can finally see it clearly, make sense of its unsettling shape. The skin is a mottled gray, tough and leathery, stretched over protruding bones. The face, the face is flat with sunken eye sockets and a gaping maw lined with needle-like teeth. I feel a wave of nausea, but under that is something like triumph. We freaking did it. But the thing, it's not the creature I saw that first night. Yes, it's similar, has those same impossible proportions, but this one is smaller, less, potent. And that's when it hits me. The thing from the other night, the one I think took Ulysses, that one was bigger. I tell Marcus my theory. He just lets out a low whistle. So, the legend's real, he says, his face grim. The whole damn nest of them. The aftermath is a blur. Call the rangers, report a dangerous animal killed in self-defense. Lots of questions and disbelief. We show them the body, what's left of it after the wild critters start digging in. Word gets around the locals, the story spreads. Folks start calling these things longwalkers, which seems as good a name as any. Some hunters take to the woods, braver or more foolhardy than me, muttering about thinning down the herd. Me, I'm done with those damn dark woods. But sometimes at night, I still think I feel those hollow eyes on me, that prickle down my spine. And I wonder, somewhere out there in the Ozarks, maybe in the deepest, most forgotten corners, is there a long walker even bigger, even more terrifying, just waiting? Back around 1982, I lived in a rural area just outside of Casper, Wyoming. My name's Cody, and back then, I was just a kid trying to survive in a tough situation. Living with my pops after my mom left wasn't easy. He wasn't the greatest guy, let's just say that. Anyway, things were already bad enough, but that summer, they took a turn for the worse. It all started with the livestock turning up dead. Mutilated. We lost a couple of calves, their carcasses torn open with a precision that seemed unnatural. Pops blamed coyotes or something at first, but the way the bodies were left, well, it sent a shiver down my spine. And that was just the beginning. A few weeks later, old Jim Holden from down the road went missing. Now, Jim was a bit of an oddball, lived alone and kept to himself, but he was harmless. His disappearance sent a ripple of worry through the community. Search parties turned up nothing, as if he'd just vanished. Pops, always the conspiracy nut, started muttering about aliens or government experiments. Me? I didn't know what to think, but fear not at my gut. The town got that quiet you always hear about in horror movies. 
you know, the one where the chirping crickets seem louder than they should be, and shadows stretch long in the twilight as though reaching out for you. Everyone walked with a wary eye, casting glances over their shoulder. I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. One night, I was out by the barn doing chores when a rancid smell hit me. It made my stomach turn. Following the stench, I came across a sight that still gives me nightmares. Three of our sheep lay gutted under the faint moonlight, their insides spilled out like some grotesque offering. I stumbled back, gagging. Something ain't right, something ain't right. The thought beat through my head like a war drum. That's when I saw him. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. A tall figure moved amongst the trees on the edge of our property. Too tall. Too lanky. The silhouette was all wrong, like a man stretched and elongated. As he turned slightly, I caught a glimpse of his face in the moonlight. It was gaunt, eyes sunken and gleaming with a predatory hunger. I froze. Adrenaline surged through my veins as he slowly turned his head. He'd spotted me. My first instinct was to run, but my feet fell rooted to the spot. The thing, the man, whatever it was, started walking towards me. Not a run, but a brisk, unsettling stride, like it knew it had all the time in the world. Pop's shotgun was inside the house. Way too far. My throat was sandpaper dry, and I knew screaming would be useless out here. In a flash of desperation, I grabbed a rusty pitchfork near the fence. It was flimsy, but it was better than nothing. The figure kept approaching, his pace steady. He was maybe twenty yards away when I realized he held something in his hand. It glinted in the moonlight, and a wave of nausea washed over me. It was one of our cow's legs, severed clean at the hip. That snapped me out of my frozen stupor. I lunged forward, screaming in a mix of fear and defiance. I jabbed the pitchfork wildly at the figure, but he dodged with impossible ease. His movements were too fast, almost inhuman. I stumbled back as he raised the cow leg like a club. I closed my eyes, expecting the crushing blow. I heard a grunt, not the terrified sound I was expecting, but something deeper, guttural. Then the sound of heavy footsteps retreating into the darkness. When I dared to open my eyes, the creature was gone. I don't remember much after that. Shaking, I ran back to the house and fumbled with the lock. Bursting inside, I slammed the door shut and bolted it, my heart pounding against my ribs. My pops, roused by the commotion, was bleary-eyed and confused, but when I told him what I saw, his face paled. He grabbed his shotgun and checked the perimeter, muttering curses under his breath. We didn't find anything, but neither of us slept that night. The next few days passed in a blur of shotguns and sleepless nights. I knew whatever that thing was, it was still out there, watching, waiting. The folks in town were even more spooked than before. The sheriff organized a larger search party, but just like with Jim, they found nothing. It was like the creature had vanished into thin air. Finally, it was more than pops than I could take. The stress, the constant fear, the feeling that we were prey, it broke us. We packed what we could carry, abandoned the farm, and drove away, never looking back. We drifted for a while, staying in cheap motels and never settling down for long. I never saw the creature again, but I feel his eyes on me even now. The memory of that gaunt face and those cold, hungry eyes haunts me to this day. It was 1993 when I got the call to a remote cabin outside of Flagstaff, Arizona Routine Stuff, or so I thought. 
My name's Tom Whitehorse, Navajo Tribal Police. I work alone a lot, the reservation's huge and understaffed, and I've seen my share of grim situations. But this one, this one would stay with me for a long time. The reporting party was a couple of hikers who'd stumbled across the scene. Said it was a damned massacre. My first thought was drug deal gone wrong. Those happen around here. But when I pulled up to that lonely cabin nestled among the pines, I knew this was something different. The door was busted open, splinters of wood littering the porch. No voices, just an eerie silence that set the hairs on the back of my neck on end. I drew my service weapon, stepping over the threshold into a scene of absolute carnage. Blood was everywhere. Sprayed across the walls, smeared across the floor, pooling in dark, sticky patches. It reeked of iron and something foul underneath. The furniture was overturned, ripped apart, like something big and furious had rampaged through the small space. Three bodies lay sprawled on the floor. Two men and a woman. They weren't just dead, they were savaged, their clothes in bloody tatters, their bodies bearing deep gouges like claw marks. One guy was missing half his face. The sight almost made me wretch. I forced myself to focus and surveyed the scene with a practiced eye. No shell casings, no sign of a struggle outside the cabin. Whatever had done this was powerful, fast, and brutal. And the smell, that underlying rot, it wasn't something I recognized. Animal attack didn't fit the patterns. What in God's name? I muttered, more to myself than anyone else. Working carefully, I took photos, documented what I could. The bodies were beyond identification. Not even dental records would help now. I radioed in, requesting backup and a forensics team. It would take hours for them to arrive. As the sun began to sink below the tree line, I found myself drawn to the back window. The forest stretched out, dense and dark. In my gut I knew that whatever had done this was out there, watching. My people have stories, old stories passed down through generations, whispers about creatures that lurk in the deepest shadows. Things most folks dismiss as legend. Me, I was never so certain. Back at the station, I poured over the photos, zooming in on the wounds, the ravaged cabin interior. The medical examiner's initial report brought no clarity. Unidentified animal, maybe a bear, something with huge claws. But bears didn't rip faces off. My captain told me to drop it, focus on the cases we could actually solve. But I couldn't let it go. Days turned into weeks. I spent my nights off duty driving those deserted backroads, scanning the darkness. Every rustle of leaves, every flicker of movement, made me jump. I carried a shotgun now, loaded with heavy buckshot. Found myself sleeping with the lights on. It was on one of those sleepless nights that I remembered something my grandfather told me when I was just a boy. He spoke of a creature from the old stories, a spirit fueled by rage and hunger, called a skinwalker. It was said to be able to take animal form, or something worse. They're rare, almost never seen, but the stories linger, whispered around campfires, shared to send a shiver down your spine. I dismissed it as myth back then, but now, now it felt eerily plausible. I started making discreet inquiries on the reservation, talking to elders, medicine men. Most dismissed me with a look or a cryptic warning. One old woman, her eyes filled with a fear I understood too well, whispered a name that made my blood run cold the Nalo SHI, the malformed one. She told me it was drawn to death, to violence, a scavenger that sometimes, sometimes created its own feast. Then she wouldn't say another word. Armed with this fragment of knowledge, 
I felt both empowered and terrified. If this thing was real, maybe there was a way to stop it. But how do you fight a legend? I decided to go back to the cabin. I told my captain I was following up on a lead, kept the details vague. She didn't like it, but she couldn't stop me. This felt personal now. I arrived at the abandoned cabin in the fading light of dusk. The air hung heavy with the same strange smell from that first day a taint of decay and something darker beneath. Night fell quickly in the forest. I positioned myself inside the cabin, my shotgun cradled in my arms, the safety disengaged. The waiting was the worst part. Every creak of the old structure, every rustle of the wind through the pines set my nerves on edge. Hours stretched by an agonizing silence. I must have dozed off for a bit because I jerked awake to a sound that made every cell in my body scream in terror. A low, guttural growl, right outside the window. Then a scraping sound, like claws against wood. My heart hammered a frantic beat against my ribs. A shadow flickered past the window, too tall, too misshapen for any animal. I raised the shotgun, my hand trembling. The thing let out another snarl, an inhuman sound filled with bloodlust. With a pounding heart, I squeezed the trigger. The roar of the shotgun blast split the night, the recoil jarring my shoulder. Through the window, I saw the creature stagger back, a pained snarl ripping from its throat. Buckshot might not kill it, but it sure as hell seemed to hurt. My hands fumbled to reload as the beast recovered. It lunged towards the window, slamming into the frame. Splinters of wood flew, some embedding themselves in my arm. I cried out, more in surprise than pain. The creature's eyes blazed with a malevolent light in the darkness. They were human eyes, I realized, twisted with madness and a hunger that went beyond the merely physical. This thing... Whatever it was, once had been a man. Driven by desperation, I fired again at point-blank range. The impact knocked the creature backwards, another guttural snarl echoing in the night. Then, it scrambled into the undergrowth, vanishing into the blackness. I sat there trembling, sweat dripping down my face, the smell of cordite thick in the air. The realization hit me. Buckshot hadn't stopped it, but it had driven it off. It was hurt, maybe seriously. Now, I had a slim chance. I bandaged my arm as best I could and left the cabin. Dawn was still hours away. I had to track it while I had a trail. In the dim moonlight, I found the blood spatter, glowing in unnatural green in the undergrowth. It wasn't natural— not from any animal I'd ever seen. I followed the trail as quickly and quietly as I could, the shotgun heavy in my hands. The woods loomed around me, every shadow playing tricks on my eyes. Every snap of a twig made me whirl around, heart pounding. As the first light of dawn began to filter through the trees, the blood trail led me to a shallow cave. The stench of decay rolled out, making me gag. I hesitated, my instincts screaming at me to run. Then I thought of the mangled bodies in the cabin, of that look in the creature's eyes. My jaw tightened, and I steeled myself to enter the darkness. The cave was small, damp, the air thick with that charnel reek. There, huddled in the shadows, was the creature. It was smaller in the daylight, hunched over, whimpering in a chilling parody of a human voice. What I saw made me gasp in horror. It was a man, or what was left of one. His body was emaciated, the skin stretched tight over bone, covered in weeping sores. His limbs were gnarled, twisted unnaturally, and his fingers ended in elongated, filthy claws. My shotgun wavered. This... This was no monster, but a man consumed by something dark and twisted. 
Was this the price of whatever foul power the Nalo SHI possessed? As I watched, the creature lifted its head. Its eyes still filled with that terrible hunger, locked with mine. A flicker of something like recognition crossed its ruined features. Then, with a guttural cry, it lunged at me. I fired out of instinct. The blast echoed in the confined space. The creature shrieked, then crumpled to the cave floor, still twitching. I approached cautiously and pumped one more round into its head. Finally, it lay still. I stumbled out of the cave into the dawn sunlight, shaking. I reported the incident, a wild animal attack. Nobody would believe the truth, and it was better that way. The forensics team would find nothing. The creature's body would disintegrate quickly back into the elements, leaving no trace. I burned the cabin to the ground. The aftermath was not easy. I had nightmares for a long time. The creature's face burned into my memory. The weight of taking a life, even a monstrous one, settled heavy on my soul. I went to a sweat lodge ceremony, seeking healing. The elders spoke of balance, of how darkness exists in the world, and sometimes someone must walk the line to protect the light. It took me years to fully process what happened. Did I save other potential victims that night? Maybe. Did I damn my own soul in the process? That's a question I wrestle with to this day. Some nights, when the wind whispers through the pines, I swear I hear a growl, distant and inhuman. I keep the shotgun loaded, just in case. Because I now know the old stories, the ones dismissed as superstition, sometimes there's a terrible truth at their heart. And out there in the shadows... Things lurk that most people are better off never seeing. The Nalo SHI may be gone, but there might be others. I stepped off the Greyhound in the summer of 1982 into the muggy Louisiana air. Bobby spotted elk. I said to the cab driver the moment his door swung open. I tossed my bag in the back and climbed in, shutting the door behind me. The cab rumbled away from the station. Everything seemed wrong from the start. Nothing moved the way things were meant to. I've spent most of my life on the reservation in Montana. The wide open spaces were part of me. Here the trees pressed close the Spanish moss hanging from them like ragged soles. The humidity wrapped around me like a wet blanket, smothering and oppressive. The cab pulled to a stop. I paid the driver and shouldered my bag, pausing at the foot of the stairs. The boarding house sat crooked and worn, in desperate need of love and a good coat of paint. The flickering neon sign buzzed intermittently. It was the only clue left to find my grandmother. I'd been fifteen when she'd vanished. My aunt had called me out of class, her voice sharp with barely concealed grief. Your gram is missing. The police haven't turned up anything yet. That had been eight years ago. I stepped across the threadbare rug in the entry. The bell above the door jangled discordantly. Mrs. Duvall sat behind the counter, engrossed in a dog-eared romance novel. She glanced up, surprise flashing across her face. Bobby spotted Elk? Your aunt called, said to expect you. Room seven's free. She pushed a tarnished brass key across the counter toward me. I felt a flare of resentment. My aunt couldn't even be bothered to come herself. The stairs creaked ominously beneath my feet. I found room seven, the paint peeling on the door. I let myself in. Musty air hung heavy in the cramped space. Faded curtains shrouded a single window overlooking the alley below. I dumped my bag on the sagging mattress and headed out to find something to eat. The streets were quiet, the heat pushing people indoors. 
A lone hound dog lay sprawled in a patch of shade on a porch, tongue lolling as it watched me pass. I turned down a side street and found a diner with a faded, chip sign declaring the establishment Millie's. The air conditioner blasting frigid air was a welcome surprise after the sweltering heat. I slipped into a booth at the back of the diner, grateful for the empty space. A harried-looking waitress bounced over, pencil poised. Han, what can I get you? Coffee. Black, I said, glancing at the menu out of habit. I already knew I wouldn't be eating, the greasy diner smell churning my stomach. The coffee was watery and bitter, not that it mattered. All this was a means to an end. My grandmother had left in the middle of the night her jewelry and most of her money left behind, but she'd taken the deed to the house. It was the house my parents had died in, leaving me and my grand to hold the crumbling pieces of our family together. The old house wasn't much, a ramshackle thing a little too close to the swamp, but Graham had refused to sell. Stubborn old woman. When I turned eighteen— I left, joining the army to put space between me and the ache that always lingered below the surface. Now my three-year hitch was up, and a letter had arrived a week before I was discharged, a lawyer down here handling my grandmother's estate. She must be dead. I didn't kid myself for a moment that she'd walked out and found a new life somewhere. At sixty-five, with barely a pot to piss in, there weren't a lot of options. The waitress returned and plunked a chipped, faded blue mug in front of me, refilling my cup. I took a sip, gritting my teeth against the scalding liquid. Not from around here, are you? The waitress asked, leaning against the table, a strand of blonde hair escaping from her hairnet. I took a breath, forcing something akin to a smile. I'd have to get used to the small talk if I was sticking around. No, Montana. Her eyes lit up. That's wild Indian territory, right? Right. I said flatly and took another sip, hoping she'd get the hint and leave me alone. No such luck. What's it like? You ever had one of those vision quests? I blinked, thrown by the unexpected question. Ah, uh, no. I had to get out of here before I gave in to the urge to dump hot coffee over her bigoted head. Look, I need to be going. I slapped a five on the table and stood up. As I hit the street again, a pricking unease settled between my shoulder blades. People lingered in the doorways, their gazes a little too keen, a little too sharp as I passed. The boarding house loomed ahead of me. Something felt wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. It was like everyone waiting for something to happen. I trudged up the stairs to my room, kicking off my boots and staring at the lumpy mattress. The urge to go back downstairs and demand my aunt's number from Mrs. Duvall was strong. I needed to talk to someone who knew more about what was going on than I did. A sharp knock at the door interrupted my thoughts. I opened it to find a young cop, his face barely out of boyhood. Mr. Spotted Elk? Yeah. He shifted his weight nervously. They found a body. Fits your grandmother's description. I, uh, need you to come down to the station for an ID. His voice squeaked on the last word. My breath caught in my throat, a cold fist closing in my chest. Finally... After all these years, some closure. An end to wondering. I grabbed my boots and followed him out. The police station buzzed with small-town energy, the sense of something important happening. A grizzled officer ushered me down a narrow hallway and into a cramped, windowless room. She slid across a blurry Polaroid. My grandmother's face stared back at me. It wasn't right. It was her, but not. Her face was etched with fear, her eyes wide with terror. And there, on her throat, four deep, ragged punctures. 
My stomach clenched. What the hell had happened to her? We found her at the old Lebeau place, the officer said. My head jerked up, an old memory stirring. Why would she go there? It has a bad reputation. Abandoned and overgrown, the old Lebeau house was nothing more than a derelict wreck, a place where the local kids would dare each other to go when they were drunk and feeling bold. The officer shrugged. Don't know. Maybe thought there might be something valuable there, worth selling. He sounded dismissive. Do you recognize her? Yes, that's my grandmother. My voice was thick. She deserved better than this, than being found dead and half-eaten in some spooky old abandoned house. After a few more questions verifying the ID, they released me out into the thick, humid night. I walked slowly, the weight of the last few hours bearing down on me. It didn't make sense. She died out there at the Lebeau place. Someone, or something, had killed her. A wave of anger washed over me, replacing the numbness. I had to find out what happened. Back at the boarding house, I grabbed my boots and pulled them on, my mind running a mile a minute. It was foolish, but I had to go back there, had to see the place for myself. There might be something there, something the police overlooked. It took me twenty minutes to walk the winding road to the edge of the swamp. The Lebeau place came into view, rising above the overgrown reeds, a sinister silhouette against the moonlit sky. As I got closer, the stench of rot hung thick in the air. My stomach turned. I pulled my shirt up over my nose and forced myself forward. The front door was gone, rotted wood littering the porch. I pulled out my flashlight, the beam cutting a swath through the dusty darkness. The floorboards creaked and sagged with my weight. I could imagine my grandmother walking carefully, searching the broken-down rooms, hope flickering in her eyes, and then the terror as realization dawned. I reached the back room where I knew they'd found her. The smell was stronger here, overpowering. I steeled myself and forced open the door. The beam of light cut through the gloom, landing on a pile of rags in the corner. My blood froze. The rags were soaked through with dark, dried blood. Scraps of tattered, flowered fabric lay scattered about fabric that looked achingly familiar. I didn't want to approach, didn't want to confirm what I already knew in my bones, but I forced myself to walk closer. The flashlight shook in my hand. Something glinted. I bent down, pushing aside a scrap of cloth, and my grandmother's turquoise necklace winked up at me in the pale beam of light. It was broken in two, the other half nowhere in sight. My mind raced. My grandmother's jewelry was proof enough she'd been here, had met her end here. But what could have left marks like that? A wild animal? But even a bear or wolf couldn't leave wounds this precise, this intentional. A sense of wrongness settled over me. There was something more going on here. I had to get out of there, go back to town, but first... I took photos, the room, the pile of blood-soaked fabric, my grandmother's necklace. I needed evidence, even if it was thin. Then, forcing back the nausea, I turned and walked quickly, purposefully through the shattered house, back to the road. The moon hung low, the air buzzing with crickets. When I reached the boarding house, I stumbled into my room, locking it behind me. I paced, my thoughts circling. The local lore flooded back to me, tales we told as kids around the reservation campfire to scare each other. Stories of shadowy figures haunting the swamps, creatures of legend. My pragmatic mind had dismissed them, of course, but now, doubt seeped in. If the Lebeau house truly was haunted, as the rumors claimed, then perhaps there was more to my grandmother's death than just an animal attack. 
But those kinds of things didn't actually exist, did they? The logical part of me rebelled against the very notion. But the raw fear in her eyes in that photo wouldn't leave me. The punctures on her throat, perfectly spaced, those weren't the work of any creature I knew. Exhaustion pulled me under like a riptide. I collapsed on the bed, still dressed. The next morning, the sun streamed through the worn curtains. My head throbbed, and a knot of fear sat in my chest. I had slept fitfully, dreams of clawing hands and gleaming eyes chasing me through the swamp. I splashed cold water on my face, forcing myself to focus. I had to talk to someone who might know more about the local folklore. Maybe there was another explanation, something I hadn't considered. On my way out, Mrs. Duvall stopped me, concern creasing her worn face. You ain't slept a wink, child. I heard you up most of the night. It's nothing. I pushed past her. If she knew what I was poking into, she'd shut up faster than a clam. The diner was my best bet. Busybodies thrived in a place like Millie's. The waitress from yesterday, Jenny, perked up when she saw me. Back for more, huh? She slid into the booth across from me. Just coffee. Got an early start. I lied. What brings you back down to these parts? She asked, refilling my cup. My grandmother. I came down for her things. Maybe I could steer the conversation in the right direction. Jenny's smile faltered. That's awful what happened. You knew her? I asked, trying to sound casual. Sure. She came in here from time to time, Jenny said, twisting a strand of hair around her finger. Sweet older lady. Folks say that old Lebeau place is cursed. Her gaze flicked to the window, a shadow crossing her face. Bingo. Cursed how? I prompted. She lowered her voice, looking around like she was afraid of being overheard. They say there's something living in that swamp. Something not right. Not right? Fear prickled down my spine. Well, tell you the truth, no one really knows. Stories get passed down, get mixed up and overblown with the years. Some folks say there's a, a monster, some kind of creature out there. I felt my heart thudding. It was crazy. And yet, it lined up with the photo, the wounds. What kind of creature? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She shrugged her discomfort clear. I don't rightly know. Ain't something you see clear as day, if you get my meaning. Of course. It was just stories, legends spun on long swampy nights. I had to get a grip. Thanks, I said, downing the last of the bitter coffee and leaving a few crumpled bills on the table. It was time to do some research. If there was even a shred of truth to the old stories, I needed to find out what I was up against. My grandmother's life depended on it. No, it was too late for her. But I'd be damned if I let whatever did this get away with it. Vengeance burned in me. The old town library smelled of dust and old paper. I settled into a back corner and began searching through the local history archives. There were stories, plenty of them, tales of strange disappearances, livestock found mutilated, sightings of a shadowy figure. It was all vague, fragmented, but the thread connecting it all was the swamp beyond the Lebeau place. One account, tucked away in a crumbling book of bayou folklore, made my blood run cold. It described a creature, hunched and feral, the river they called it. A shapeshifter, half-man, half-beast, with razor-sharp teeth. Stories of something like this stretched back for over a century, always circling the edges of the swamp. I knew, bone-deep, that this was what I was dealing with. My pragmatic mind still fought against it, 
but fear battled back with images of my grandmother's terror-filled eyes and the brutal puncture marks in her photo. There was nothing else it could be. It was late afternoon when I emerged from the library, a plan taking shape in my mind. The sun would set soon, and with night would come the creature. I went back to the boarding house and dug into my duffel bag. Beneath my spare clothes lay my old hunting rifle, rarely used except for target practice back on the reservation. I checked the action, loaded it with silver bullets. Werewolves were the stuff of horror movies, but silver hurt most things that didn't belong in this world. Night settled in. Instead of my room, I went to the roof of the boarding house. From there, I had a clear view of the road twisting out to the swamp. I sat, rifle across my lap, and waited. Hours slipped by, the silence broken only by the rustle of leaves and distant croak of frogs. Doubt not at me. Was I chasing shadows, fueled by grief and half-remembered stories? Then, a noise, a snap of a twig far below. I tensed, every nerve on high alert. A shadow moved at the edge of the road. My heart slammed in my chest. It shambled into the weak moonlight, a hunched figure with glowing, yellow eyes. It paused, sniffing the air, and then turned its head to look straight at me. That was my chance. I raised the rifle, steadied my aim, and fired. Three shots rang through the night. There was a guttural howl, the sound of something large crashing through the underbrush. I waited, barely breathing. Had I hit it? Wounded it? There was no sign of the creature. I sat for a long time, until the first fingers of dawn reached across the sky. If I'd wounded it, it'd retreat back to the depths of the swamp, at least for a while. And even if I hadn't, the noise would scare it away from town. It had cost my grandmother her life, but at least I'd prevented any more deaths. For now. I walked back to my room, body heavy, dawn washing the sky in shades of pale pink. The logical part of me wanted to laugh at myself, chalk this up to sleeplessness and old superstitions. But I knew that wasn't possible anymore. The world was a bit bigger, a bit wilder, than I'd ever believed. And there were things lurking in that wildness, things I wouldn't forget. The year was 1978, and I was deep in the heart of Yellowstone National Park. Always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie, me. Not content with the usual tourist trails, I craved the raw wilderness, the kind of places where you could go days without seeing another soul. Call me reckless, call me an idiot, but I felt most alive when I was out there, pushing my own limits. My name's Wyatt, Wyatt Lawson. I'd been on a solo backpacking trip for almost a week rugged terrain, thick pine forests, and those steaming geothermal pools that Yellowstone is famous for. On this particular day, I was hiking along a narrow ridgeline, heading towards a peak with a view I knew would knock my socks off. The trail wound along the crest of the ridge, sharp drop-offs on either side. That morning, a heavy fog had rolled in, obscuring the trail in places and adding an eerie cast to the landscape. I wasn't too worried. It would burn off later in the day, or so I hoped. It was that damn fog that led me to stumble upon something I wish I hadn't. An offshoot of the trail, barely visible, disappearing into the thick mist. Now, in hindsight, my biggest mistake was following it. The path led me into a narrow, shadowed gully. The surrounding hillsides muffled the usual forest sounds, creating a strange, deadened silence that made the skin on the back of my neck prickle. The air smelled damp, musty. Suddenly, a rustle. 
a loud snapping of branches from further within the gully. Hello? Anyone there? I called out, my voice sounding unnaturally loud in the quiet. Nothing. I edged further in, every instinct screaming at me to turn around. That's when I saw it. An old cabin, half hidden amongst the trees and rocks. Wood planked, with a sagging roof and broken windows, it looked like it had been abandoned for decades. Then again, this far off the beaten track, who knows what you might find. Something flickered at one of those busted-out windows. My skin crawled. I knew I should get out of there, back to the ridge trail, but curiosity was my Achilles' heel. I approached the cabin cautiously. As I got closer, something about it felt off. Not just the decay, but a sense of wrongness, of something rotten festering beneath the surface. My hand hovered over the old, rusted doorknob. I hesitated, then, gripped by a perverse sort of fascination, I pushed open the door. It creaked on its hinges, the sound echoing through the deathly silence of the gully. The interior was even worse than I'd expected. Dark, dirt-caked floors, bits of moldy furniture rotting away in the corners. It reeked of wet wood and something worse, a rancid, coppery smell that made my stomach churn. And then, there was a sound I'll never forget. A low, guttural growl that seemed to come from the very walls of the cabin. I spun around, heart pounding in my ears. A hulking figure stood silhouetted in the shadows at the back of the room. It took a lumbering step forward, and I finally saw it clearly. The thing was enormous, easily over seven feet tall. Its body was lean, almost skeletal, with taut, leathery skin stretched over protruding bones. Its face. God, its face. It was gaunt, with a sharp, elongated jaw and eyes that burned like hot coals in the dim light. Not an animal, not exactly. But not fully human either. As it moved closer, I saw its hands were tipped with long, yellowed claws, and its teeth. They were sharp, too many, like some monstrous predator. This wasn't a sick bear or a hermit. This was something else entirely. A surge of adrenaline blasted through me, overriding the shock. I fumbled for the hunting knife strapped to my belt. The creature hissed, bearing those terrible teeth. It lunged, its movement impossibly fast for something so ungainly. I barely managed to dodge its claws stumbling back. My pack. I'd left it by the door. I needed to get to it, to the gun I kept inside for emergencies. I bolted towards the door, the creature loping after me. I heard it snarling, felt its foul breath on the back of my neck. Reaching the doorway. I flung my pack towards the creature, half hoping it might distract it. I tore out into the mist, back towards the ridge. The fog closed in like a smothering blanket, making it hard to tell where I was going. I ran blindly, stumbling over roots and rocks, the creature's grunting gaining on me. It knew this terrain far better than I did. The mist was playing tricks, too was that the ridge ahead or just another cruel mirage. A flicker of movement caught my eye. A figure, tall and thin, stepping out from the fog. For a wild moment, I thought, rescue. But as the figure moved closer, a fresh wave of terror washed over me. This one, its skin was an unhealthy gray, stretched tight over a distended belly. Its mouth hung open, slack-jawed, and its eyes, sunken deep in its skull, seemed to bore right through me. I'd escaped one monster, only to stumble upon another. Two of them. They circled me, guttural growls rumbling in their throats, the sound echoing through the fog. My knees started to buckle. I knew there was no way out. Whatever these things were, they were hungry, and I was their prey. I thought of the gun in my pack, 
now surely torn apart by the first creature in the cabin. Even if I'd had it, what chance did bullets have against these abominations? I raised the knife in a pathetic gesture of resistance. As the two creatures closed in, I expected pain, the tearing of flesh. Instead, there was a sudden, piercing screech that split the air. Both creatures froze mid-stride. They whipped their heads around, searching for the source of the sound. A third figure emerged from the fog. A woman, dressed all in white, a long, flowing robe stained with dirt and blood. She was slender, but moved with a strength that belied her frame. In her hand she held a gleaming silver dagger. The creatures snarled, circling her warily but with a tremor in their movements, like dogs sensing a dominant force. The woman's eyes, sharp and fierce, never left them. Be gone, she commanded, her voice surprisingly clear and strong despite her slight form. Leave this place. There is no more for you here. The creature with the taut skin let out an ear-splitting shriek, a sound that seemed filled with both fear and rage. It lunged at the woman, but she moved with incredible speed, dodging its clumsy attack and slashing at it with the dagger. There was a blinding flash of light, a smell of burning hair, and the creature howled in pain, scrambling away into the fog. Its companion hesitated for a moment, then vanished back into the grayness. The woman turned to me. Can you move? she asked, her voice softening. I could only nod, still too shocked to speak. She tossed me what was left of my pack and motioned for me to follow. I didn't question her, just stumbled along, dazed, barely registering the path we took. Finally, we emerged from the dense fog back onto the ridge trail. You're safe now, she said, her voice calmer. Follow this trail to the main road. Don't look back. She turned and disappeared back into the mist, as suddenly as she'd appeared. I wanted to call after her, to ask questions, but something in her demeanor, a sense of ancient purpose, kept my tongue tied. By the time I reached the ranger station, I'd regained enough of my wits to know that telling the truth would land me in a padded cell. I spun a story about a bear attack, showed them my torn-up pack as evidence. They bought it, though I saw suspicion in the eyes of one older ranger. Word travels fast in a place like Yellowstone. Soon, I heard hushed whispers about unusual animal sightings, of a strange woman seen lurking in the fog. But my story remained just that, a story. The creatures, the cabin, it all faded into the realm of half-remembered nightmares. Yet something shifted in me. The wilderness I'd once sought thrills and now held a lingering darkness. Eventually, I left that life behind entirely. Took up a quiet job in a bookstore, found solace in the printed word rather than the unpredictable world outside. But on foggy days I can still feel their eyes on me, hot and predatory. The creatures in the gully, were they some isolated offshoot of humanity, driven mad and monstrous by solitude? Were they remnants of an older, crueler world that lurks just beneath the surface of our own? Or perhaps, like the woman in white, they are something else entirely. A force neither wholly good nor evil, playing out a battle just beyond our perception. I still think of her, sometimes. The woman who appeared from nowhere and saved my life. Who was she? And why did she seem so burdened, like she carried a terrible, ancient weight upon her shoulders? I'll never know the answers, and maybe it's for the best. There are some shadows you're better off not chasing. Some mysteries are better left untouched. I suppose the creature in that cabin was a type of ghoul, or a wendigo of some sort. But the truth? Well, the truth is forever bound up with those swirling mists and the echoing silence of that forgotten gully.
This happened to me on February 8, 1993. My name's Doug Ellis, and I've been a deputy in the town of Pine Creek, Montana, for almost 10 years. Married, got two kids, Becky and Lil Tommy, cute as buttons they are. Before Pine Creek, I served in the Marines. Maybe that's why I was drawn to law enforcement. Or maybe that's why when everything went to hell, well, you'll see. It all started with the cattle disappearances. A few head missing here and there, nothing too alarming at first. Ranchers chalked it up to coyotes or a mountain lion that had strayed down from the higher elevations. But then the carcasses started turning up. Half-eaten, some torn apart in ways no normal predator would do, and always drained of blood, like something out of a Dracula movie. Ranchers started getting spooked, the whispers began, mostly jokingly, about werewolves or Bigfoot gone rogue. I laughed along, but deep down, a cold feeling started worming its way into my gut. Then, old man Tucker vanished. Tucker lived way out in the boonies, the kind of stubborn old coot who refused to use a cell phone and liked to brag that he hadn't been to a doctor since the Korean War. When his daughter reported him missing after a few days of not being able to reach him, I figured we'd find him holed up in his cabin, drunk on moonshine and passed out in front of the TV. We found the cabin all right. The door was splintered inward like a bear had busted through it, and inside was a horror scene. The furniture was smashed to pieces, blood was splattered across the walls, the floor, even the ceiling. The whole place reeked of something rotten, like a butcher shop left out in the summer sun. No sign of Tucker, just a single, massive, clawed footprint pressed into the blood-soaked wood floor. Word got out and the whole town went into a tailspin. Folks started double-bolting their doors, arming themselves like they were expecting an invasion. Sheriff Thompson sent in a request for wildlife specialists. He figured maybe we were dealing with some kind of mutated bear, something environmental toxins had driven mad, a plausible theory, if it weren't for the nagging details that didn't fit. The wildlife guys came and went. Their thermal imaging traps stayed up for a week, catching nothing but the usual critters. They left shaking their heads, muttering about how they couldn't explain what had happened over at Tucker's place. I started keeping a sawed-off shotgun by my bed, and the nightmares began. A few nights later, I was on patrol along a lonely back road that skirted the base of the mountains. It was close to midnight, snow coming down heavy, the kind of night where anything could be lurking in the white shadows. My radio crackled, and I tensed, thinking it was another report of a missing pet or a spooky noise some anxious resident thought was a monster. Instead, it was Becky Thompson, the sheriff's daughter, and her usual crew of troublemakers out for a joyride their voices slurred and laughter echoing too loudly over the static. Those idiots, I muttered to myself, checking the rearview mirror. Sure enough, I saw headlights weaving erratically behind me. I pulled over, intending to read those kids the riot act and maybe even haul one of them to the station to sober up. But as the headlights got closer, something felt off. The car— an old, beat-up Chevy, was weaving too much, and it seemed to be going way too fast on the icy road. That's when I saw it. A hulking shape leaped out of the darkness and landed on the hood of the car. It was enormous, bigger than any bear, silhouetted against the swirling snow and headlights. The car swerved, trying to shake whatever it was off, then skidded completely off the road and plowed into a snowdrift. Instincts honed from the Marines and years on the force took over. I grabbed my shotgun, threw the cruiser into park, and charged toward the Chevy. I could hear screaming, high-pitched and terrified, cut short by the sound of shattering glass and the guttural snarl of the thing. I reached the car, 
its headlights still blazing into the snowy darkness. The windows were smashed, and the inside was splattered with blood. Becky and one of the boys were gone, dragged out through the broken glass. Of the other two, there wasn't much left to find. And then I turned and saw it, crouched amidst the snow flurries, a monstrous form vaguely familiar yet horrifyingly inhuman all at once. It was at least eight feet tall when it reared up on its hind legs, covered in coarse, matted fur. Its face was stretched and elongated, all teeth and predatory eyes that glowed a sickening yellow. That's when it let loose a blood-chilling howl, a sound that ripped through the night air and sent a primal surge of terror coursing through my veins. I aimed the shotgun and fired, the blast echoing through the night. It roared in pain, a hot spray of blood splattering the snow. Somehow, I kept firing, each shot punctuated by its bone-shaking growls. I don't know how many times I pulled the trigger, only that my shotgun finally clicked empty. Wounded, the creature lunged. I barely had time to brace myself before it slammed into me, sending both of us tumbling into the snow. I felt claws rake across my chest, tearing through my jacket, and a hot, foul breath wash over my face. Somehow, I managed to roll, the snow cushioning my fall but also sending a blinding spray of ice into my eyes. I scrambled to my feet, fumbling for the spare shells in my pocket. The thing was circling me, growling low, its monstrous form moving with terrifying agility despite its injuries. The snow was falling too hard, visibility was crap, and my hands were shaking from the adrenaline and the numbing cold. Then, through the swirling storm, I saw another set of headlights approaching along the lonely road. Salvation, at least that's what I hoped. I raised one hand and waved frantically, my other hand clutching the shotgun and hastily reloading. The car skidded to a stop, the driver's door flung open and Sheriff Thompson emerged, his expression unreadable. He took in the scene, the wrecked Chevy, the blood staining the snow, and me, disheveled and wild-eyed, standing in the middle of it all. Ellis! he shouted, his voice a mix of authority and concern. What in God's name? Behind him, a couple more deputies piled out of the car, their guns drawn, scanning the snowy darkness for the threat. That's when the creature chose to strike. It burst from the veil of snow, charging straight towards the unwitting deputies. There was a flurry of shouts, panicked gunfire, and the echoing roar of the creature in pain. Through the chaos, I caught glimpses of the deputies scrambling back towards the car, trying to escape the beast's relentless attack. Thompson, though, he stood his ground. Using the car door as makeshift cover, he emptied his revolver at the creature. The bullets seemed to have little effect, merely enraging it further. It swatted aside one deputy like a ragdoll, then lunged for Thompson, jaws gaping wide. I couldn't just stand there. Reloaded shotgun in hand, I sprinted through the snow towards the sheriff, towards the monstrous form locked in a deadly embrace with him. With a desperate surge of strength, I slammed the stock of my shotgun into the side of the creature's head. It snarled and whipped around, releasing its grip on Thompson and turning its fury on me. I fired point-blank, blasting a hole in its side, the impact momentarily staggering the monstrous thing. It screeched in agony, thrashing and clawing at the air. The other deputies, having scrambled back to their feet, added their gunfire to mine. Still, the creature raged, its strength fueled by a terrifying, unnatural fury. It took a dozen, maybe more, shots to finally bring it down. There was a final, shuddering heave of its massive body, then it slumped to the ground, its unnatural yellow eyes fading to a dull, lifeless gray. Silence descended, 
broken only by our harsh panting and the soft hiss of falling snow. Thompson pushed himself to his feet, a streak of blood dripping down his forehead. The deputies cautiously approached the creature's body, guns still trained on its massive form, ensuring it wasn't playing dead. What the hell? Was all Thompson could manage, his voice filled with a mixture of shock and a weary grimness. He looked at me, some unspoken understanding passing between us. The aftermath was a whirlwind of disbelief, frantic cover-ups, and whispered tales that twisted and expanded with each retelling. The official story was a rabid bear, a freak occurrence driven mad by some unknown toxin. The mutilated bodies in the Chevy, well, they conveniently blamed that on a high-speed collision with a deer, the wild animal story a plausible explanation for the carnage. The creature, what was left of it, vanished into some government lab, never to be seen again by the eyes of the public. Folks who asked too many questions quickly found themselves the target of disapproving glances and hushed whispers. Pine Creek quieted down, the terror receding into the shadows, life returning to a semblance of normalcy. But some of us, Thompson, the few deputies who faced the creature that night, and me, we know the truth. We formed a silent, unofficial brotherhood, bound by experience none outside our circle could ever understand. Sometimes, late at night, I still jolt awake in a cold sweat, the memory of those glowing yellow eyes and the creature's fetid breath seared into my mind. I checked the lock on Becky's bedroom door twice, the sight of her sleeping peacefully my only salvation from the terrors lurking in my memory. I still patrol those lonely mountain roads, and on snowy nights, I sometimes imagine the crunch of tires on fresh snow, the distant sound of terrified screams carried on the whistling wind. My hand tightens on the shotgun by my side, ever-present, ever-ready. You see, the thing about monsters, the truly horrifying ones, is not just their claws and their teeth. It's the knowledge that they exist, lurking on the fringes of our understanding. It's the knowledge that there might be more out there, unseen and waiting. And it's the silent, unspoken question that echoes in the stillness of those Montana nights. What if it comes back? My name is Rick Slater, and this happened to me back in 2001. It was my first year on the job, fresh out of the academy. You might find it hard to believe, but if I'm being honest, I still have a tough time processing it myself sometimes. The official title is Special Cryptid Investigations Unit, but most folks who know about us just call us Monster Hunters pretty straightforward, all things considered. We're a hush-hush branch of the government, called in when local law enforcement hits a dead end on those unexplainable cases. You know the ones, cattle mutilations, hiker disappearances, strange sightings in the woods. That's where we step in. This incident took me to Oregon. A string of missing persons reports all centered around a small town nestled in the foothills of the Cascade Range. Folks were vanishing without a trace poof gone. The local cops were stumped, especially since the disappearances didn't fit any usual pattern. Hikers, sure, accidents happen. But there was also the elderly woman who went missing from her porch swing in broad daylight and the teenager last seen walking home from school who never made it through the front door. I was teamed up with two other agents, Mike Harris and Sarah Thompson. Mike was the old-timer, a weathered veteran with a gruff voice and eyes that had seen too many things to be truly at ease anymore. Sarah was sharp as a tack, ex-military, and the only one of the three of us who never flinched when things got weird. We rolled into town under the guise of National Park Service representatives. 
You learn pretty quickly in this business that discretion is your best weapon. This town was hurting. Everyone knew someone who had gone missing. There was a tension in the air, a sense of lurking fear. Our first stop was the sheriff's office. Sheriff Davis was a tired-looking man with deep lines etched on his face. He'd been leading the investigation into the disappearances, and the frustration gnawed at him. I appreciate the help, but don't expect any miracles, he warned us, pushing a stack of case files across the desk. We've gone over this with a fine-tooth comb. There just ain't nothing to go on. We spent the next few days interviewing witnesses. Or rather, people with little to offer except speculation and terror. One woman tearfully described a shadow bigger than a bear moving through the trees near her house the night before her husband disappeared. A gas station attendant spoke of a rank smell like rotting meat hanging over a van that one of the missing persons had been seen driving. Bits and pieces, nothing to shape into a coherent picture. The break in the case came with a shaky 911 call from a hunter out in the dense part of the forest. He claimed to have found something, stumbled on a, well, it wasn't clear exactly what he'd found. Only that it wasn't good. We loaded up the jeep with field gear, the kind not issued to your average park ranger, and followed his directions deep into the woods. That's when things started to feel off. I'm not talking about spooky vibes. It was an instinct, the honed sense of a predator sizing up its surroundings. The hair on the back of my neck prickled. Mike and Sarah shared uneasy glances. Everyone felt it. The hunter, a burly fellow named Chuck, was waiting for us at a trailhead, his face pale. He led us further into the trees, the undergrowth thick and clinging. Finally, he stopped at the edge of a clearing. And that's where we first saw it. Not the creature, no, something it had done. It was like a crime scene plucked out of a nightmare. There was a crude structure in the center of the clearing a nest of sorts, woven from branches, mud, and things. Clothing, scraps of backpacks, a mangled hiking boot. Bow rose in my throat. This wasn't an animal leaving behind trophies. This was something calculating, something with a chilling intelligence. At the far end of the clearing was a cave opening, half concealed by tangled vines. It dragged them in there, Chuck whispered, his voice cracking. Mike pulled a high-powered flashlight from his pack and gestured for us to form up. Sarah reached for the rifle slung across her back, the safety clicking off. I gripped my own firearm, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. We moved forward, flashlights cutting through the gloom. The cave entrance loomed closer, a gaping maw in the side of the hill. The stench emanating from it was almost overpowering, a mix of decay and something foul I couldn't place. I exchanged a look with Mike. This was it. We stepped inside, the darkness enveloping us. The ground was uneven, littered with bones, animal. I hoped. The beams of our flashlights danced over the walls, carving grotesque shadows out of the damp stone. Then it hit me. That smell, I recognized it. Iron. Blood. Eyes sharp. My kissed. We pressed deeper into the cave, our movements slow, deliberate. That's when we heard it. A low growl that rumbled through the tunnel reverberating in my chest. Something was ahead, and it knew we were here. Mike raised his fist, silently signaling us to halt. The growl intensified, followed by a scraping sound, like claws against rock. There, up ahead, a flicker of movement caught our flashlights. A pair of eyes glinted in the darkness, bright yellow, reflecting the light. It was massive, Easily eight feet tall when it reared up on its hind legs, its form skeletal, 
muscles taut and rippling beneath grayish, hairless skin. Its head was elongated, too many teeth crowded into a mouth that stretched far too wide. This was no bear, no mutated wolf. This was something else. Something old and unnatural. It lunged. Chaos erupted. Gunfire echoed through the confined space, flashes illuminating the creature's grotesquely distorted features. Sarah screamed, more enraged than terror, I think, as it swiped a massive clawed hand at her. The creature was fast, impossibly so for its size. It dodged our bullets, blurred shadows against the rock walls. The cave was too tight to maneuver. It had the advantage. Mike yelled something, but then the creature was on him, knocking him to the ground with a force that reverberated through the cave. Mike hit the cave wall hard, his gun flying from his grasp. I fired. Once, twice, aiming for the creature's head. It snarled, a spray of blood flying as one of my shots found its mark. The creature twisted, its attention now fully on me. It stalked towards me, its eyes burning, promising a gruesome death. Sarah was suddenly there, pulling Mike to his feet in one fluid motion. Cover fire! she yelled, her rifle spitting bullets at the creature, forcing it to dodge and weave. Mike stumbled over to where his gun had landed and grabbed it, regaining his footing. I took my chance, firing again trying to keep the creature back while Sarah and Mike scrambled to reposition themselves. Another shot struck, this time in the shoulder, eliciting a furious howl from the creature. But it wasn't enough. It lunged again, this time going for Sarah. She rolled desperately, the creature's claws tearing through her jacket, narrowly missing her flesh. Mike fired a burst, driving the creature back momentarily. Fall back, he shouted, his voice hoarse. I didn't need to be told twice. We retreated further into the tunnel, the creature's snarls fading behind us. We reached a fork in the cave, two dark passageways branching out. Split up! Sarah barked, already sprinting towards the left passage. It can't chase us both. Mike took a deep breath turning towards the right passage. Go! We'll meet back at the entrance. I hesitated, guilt and unease warring inside me, leaving Mike to face that thing alone. But he was right. We'd only be sitting ducks if we stayed together. With a final nod, I turned and ran, following Sarah's fading footsteps. The tunnel was a twisting, claustrophobic nightmare, the damp, earthy air felt heavy in my lungs as I pushed myself harder. Behind me, I heard a crash and a roar that echoed down the other passage. Mike had bought me some time. I owed it to him to not waste it. I burst out of the cave, blinking in the sudden sunlight. Where was Sarah? Before I could catch my breath, something slammed into me from the side, knocking me to the ground. It was the creature. I fought back, scrambling and kicking. Its claws raked across my arm, drawing hot lines of pain. The stink of its breath choked me as it snapped its elongated jaws inches from my face. I yelled, shoving with all my remaining strength. A gunshot echoed, and the creature jolted. A second shot, and it reared up, bellowing in pain. I rolled away and scrambled to my feet. Sarah stood at the tree lean, rifle steady, her face a mask of grim determination. The creature hesitated, then turned and bolted back into the cover of the cave. You okay? Sarah asked, rushing over to me. I managed a shaky nod, clutching my wounded arm. Mike Dash, I know, she said quietly. There's no point in going back in there now. We need to get out of here. It was a blur after that. A frantic hike back to the jeep, 
a choked-up call for backup on the satellite radio, an agonizing wait for extraction as darkness fell over the forest. And always the image of Mike, his eyes wide with terror as the creature closed in. They never found his remains. Whatever lair that creature had deeper in the caves, there was nothing left for them to recover. Just another name added to the missing persons list. The official report, sanitized and spun for public consumption, attributed the disappearances to an unknown animal attack. Sarah, myself, and the backup team that arrived, we all swore to secrecy. They gave us our commendations and shuffled us off to the next assignment. But we knew. We'd looked that thing in the eye. Seen the hunger, the cunning intelligence in its gaze. This wasn't just some oversized beast. There was too much calculation in its savagery. In the years since, I'd been on a dozen other hunts, Sasquatch sightings in the Pacific Northwest strange lights over remote desert valleys. But none of them compared to that cave in Oregon. It left a mark on me, a cold sense of dread I can't quite shake. You see, the government knows. Sure, they downplay it, compartmentalize it, but those in the inner circles know the truth. We aren't alone on this planet. There are things lurking in the shadows, older and hungrier than we can understand. They play by different rules, and more often than not, we're hopelessly outmatched. The locals call it the Shadow Walker, now, whispered tales around campfires. Another cryptid myth to fuel the legend. They don't know how close to the truth they are. It walks in the shadows because the light of civilization is the only place it can't follow not yet, anyway. After Oregon, Sarah left the unit. Couldn't handle it any more, she said. Don't blame her one bit. Sometimes I wonder if I should do the same, walk away while I'm still in one piece. Maybe find a nice, quiet desk job somewhere far from the backwoods. But then I think about those missing persons. The faces in the case files, the ones left behind with nothing but unanswered questions. And my, gone in a dark cave for a creature the world refuses to believe exists. No, I can't walk away. Someone has to stand at the edge of the darkness and watch for what crawls out of it. I don't know how long any of us can last or what the cost will be in the end. But someone has to try. My name is Sam, and this happened to me in the fall of 2008. I was a long-haul trucker then, crisscrossing the country. It was more than a paycheck. There was a thrill to being on your own, the rhythm of the road, just you and your rig. Most of the time. My son was born that same year, and suddenly the open road felt less liberating and more lonely. But we needed the money so I kept those wheels turning. One route took me up through Wyoming, a beautiful drive if you're a fan of wide open spaces. And I was, mostly. But some stretches felt too desolate, too much of nothing in between those scattered towns. This particular night, I'd opted for a secondary highway rather than the interstate, hoping to save some time. Turns out, it wasn't the smartest decision. For miles, it was just me, the beam of my headlights, and the moon hanging huge in the sky. Then, from the side of the road, I caught a flicker of movement in the scrub. I hit the brakes, heart thumping. An animal? Maybe a deer or a coyote, but whatever it was, it darted back out of sight. It wasn't until I'd stopped completely that I realized the shape was too big, too upright, to have been an animal. I told myself it was fatigue playing tricks on my eyes. I rolled forward, scanning the roadside. Nothing. Shaking it off as nerves, I continued at a reduced speed. A mile down, 
it happened again. This time, I saw it clearly, someone standing stock still in the brush, watching me pass. And I could swear it was facing the wrong way, head twisted around. A prankster trying to give me a scare? Out here, it was more chilling than funny. I pressed down on the gas, putting a few more miles between myself and whatever was back there. But the uneasy feeling lingered, growing worse with every passing shadow. Up ahead, a cluster of lights broke the monotony, a little town, or maybe just a roadside diner. Hope flared. Maybe some hot food, even just a bathroom break, would break the tension. The place turned out to be a gas station a lonely outpost with too many dim bulbs and a buzzing neon sign. There was one other vehicle parked beside the pumps, an old van with peeling paint. Two teenage girls were hanging out beside it, smoking, and the sight of them should have been reassuring. But there was something off about them, in their fixed smiles and two bright eyes. My earlier unease returned with a vengeance. I fueled up fast, but something made me linger by my truck. In hindsight, it was the kind of dumb choice that only happens in horror movies. I peered down the road, trying to see if there was anyone, any sign of movement, out there in the darkness. I still don't know why I didn't just get back in my truck and drive. That was when I heard it, a rustling from behind me. I turned. Two figures were emerging from the shadows by the back of the gas station. One was short and stooped, moving with a strange side-to-side -side shuffle. The other was tall, freakishly tall, its limbs too long and too thin. And that was my cue to finally make a sensible decision. I ran for my truck, fumbling with the keys. The figures were closing in, the tall one moving with surprising speed. Somehow I got the door open, threw myself inside, and slammed it shut. The two of them converged on my truck, pounding on the windows, and that's when I saw it clearly. The taller figure's face, twisted and wrong, pressed against the glass. Its eyes burned into mine, empty and black. And in that instant I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that these weren't just some backwoods weirdos. There was something else, something hungry. I fumbled for the gear shift, throwing the truck into reverse. The thing clawed at my door handle, teeth clicking inches from my face. I stomped on the gas, tires squealing as the truck lurched backward. In the rearview mirror, I saw them standing side by side, watching me go. I put as much distance as possible between me and that godforsaken place. My hands were shaking so badly I had to pull over and throw up on the side of the road. When I could drive again, I didn't go back the way I came. I kept driving north, the adrenaline coursing in my veins, making sleep impossible. By dawn, I'd hit a major highway in the relative safety of other travelers. I called my wife then, shaky and incoherent, telling her I wasn't sure when I'd be home. She was used to odd hours, but something in my voice scared her. I'd promised her I'd make it up to her, to her and our son. My name is Jason Walker, and this happened to me in September of 2014. I've spent the last seven years with the National Park Service, stationed mostly here in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. A good gig. The Smokies get their share of tourists, especially during fall foliage season, but there's still vast stretches of old-growth forests, places where you can walk for hours without seeing another soul. My partner is Kayla, been a ranger almost as long as I have. She grew up around here, knows these woods like the back of her hand. You wouldn't guess it from her slight build and easygoing smile, but she's tough as nails and the most reliable backup anyone could ask for. 
couple weeks back, we got called out to a missing persons case. A couple, Mark and Linda, middle-aged hikers, hadn't checked back in with their family after a day hike on the Gatlin Hollow Trail. Routine, probably just an equipment malfunction or a sprained ankle. Still, standard procedure. Head in, locate them, and assist them back out of the woods. We reached the trailhead around midday and began hiking in. The trail wound up through a dense stand of hemlock and beech trees, a green tunnel dappled with sunlight. Kayla was setting a brisk pace. We chatted a bit to pass the time, mostly work stuff, equipment updates, some recent bear sightings needing more thorough documentation, the usual ranger banter. As we trekked deeper in, I noticed something odd. Not the unsettling quiet I'd come to expect from the deep woods, but the lack of it. Normally, these forests hum with life, birdsong, the rustle of squirrels, the distant creak of trees swaying in the breeze. Not today, though. An oppressive silence hung in the air. I mentioned it to Kayla. Don't worry, she said with a wink. Just means more critters for us to spot. We pressed on. Nearing the four-mile mark, something caught my eye. A flash of color amidst the green, bright pink, neon almost. It was a woman's backpack, discarded beside the trail. A chill ran down my spine. Linda's backpack had been described as the same style, same color. I knelt, examining the bag. The main compartment was zipped shut, but a side pocket was spilled open, the contents scattered in the dirt. Granola bar wrappers, a lip balm, a crushed water bottle. All could be routine trail litter, or signs of a hasty departure. Kayla was beside me, radio in hand. Dispatch, this is Ranger Walker. We've found a possible match for Linda's belongings. Over. The reply crackled back. Copy that, Walker. Proceed with caution. Over. We exchanged a grim look. No time to waste. We upped our pace, scanning the forest on either side of the trail, searching for any sign of our missing hikers. The silence was starting to gnaw at my nerves, the sunlight feeling strangely cold. Up ahead, the trail took a sharp curve, obscuring the view ahead. Kayla raised a fist, signaling a halt. As we crept forward, a noise drifted out from behind the bend. A snapping sound, like branches breaking. Then a groan, low, guttural, and definitely not human. Adrenaline surged through me. I drew my gun, Kayla mirroring my action. There was no time to form a plan. We rounded that bend and came face to face with it. The creature was hunched over something large and pale. At first, all I registered was the wrongness of it, the emaciated frame stretching translucent skin, the limbs twisted at impossible angles, terminating in wickedly long claws. Then it raised its head from the gore on the ground, and I saw the face. It was mostly skull, with two wide jaws filled with needle-like teeth. But the worst were the eyes, sunken black pits reflecting the dappled light in a way that made my stomach churn. It let out a screech, rising in pitch and making my ears ache. The remains of something human, Mark, I realized with sick certainty, slid from its grasp. Kayla reacted first, firing two shots that echoed through the empty forest. The creature flinched, but didn't go down. It snarled, baring those hideous teeth, then darted into the trees with unnatural speed. Kayla knelt beside Mark, but a single glance told me it was hopeless. His body was mangled, broken in ways no fall could explain, and partially consumed, the ragged edges of the wounds glistening in the sunlight. Jason, Kayla's voice was taut. Call it in. I did, my voice barely above a whisper. As I fumbled with the radio, D-1 
detailing the attack, the creature, the gruesome scene, part of me couldn't believe what my own eyes were seeing. Dispatch didn't believe it either, their responses laced with skepticism and doubt. I held my ground, my words coming faster now, anger simmering beneath the shock. We weren't dealing with some rabid animal. We'd encountered something else. By the time reinforcements arrived, the creature was long gone. We left Mark's remains, cordoned off the area, every step feeling like desecration of a crime scene. Back at HQ, the debriefing went as badly as I'd anticipated. Blank stares. Disbelief masquerading as professionalism. They put me on mandatory leave pending a psych evaluation. Kayla backed me up, but I saw the doubt flickering behind her eyes too. The official report? Wild animal attack, victim identity being verified, incident under investigation. A neat, tidy package for public consumption, hiding a monstrous truth. I never went back to my desk job. Left the apartment, let it all go. Couldn't bear the sight of those pristine trails bustling with oblivious tourists knowing what lurked below the surface. Now I live on the fringes, a drifter. I've picked up bits and pieces of information, enough to be sure I'm not alone, scattered sightings from other parks, rumors that whisper of similar creatures, and the rangers who disappear trying to hunt them down. I remember it like it was yesterday, though the exact date eludes me. I'm not one for calendars, never have been. My name's Marvin Diggory, and I've been a truck driver for more years than I care to count. On a regular route through a remote part of Nevada, I often pass through a small town called Goldfield. Nothing much to see or do in that town, but it breaks the monotony of the desert drive. The day began like any other, with me hauling my load from Las Vegas to Reno. It was just another day's work, and my spirits were high as I heard some jokes on the radio, something about a chicken crossing the road. This chuckle was quickly replaced with dread when I saw something strange up ahead. As I approached Goldfield, I noticed something peculiar on the side of the road. It appeared to be the remnants of a brutal attack, blood, torn fabric, and unidentifiable bits scattered about. Not wanting to lose any more time and hoping to get some help or answers in Goldfield, I continued driving towards the town. Upon arriving in Goldfield, I parked near an old diner that had seen better days. The sign out front read, Maggie's Diner, which by all accounts seemed like an innocuous place to grab some grub and maybe ask about what happened out on the road. As soon as my boot hit the ground upon exiting my rig, however, things started feeling off. The atmosphere felt thick with tension. It was as if everyone in town knew something I didn't but refused to share. It wasn't surprising that no one mentioned any recent events or visitors. After all, who wants to be too forthcoming with information about potential trouble? Still, their reluctance added to my growing unease. This mounting unease culminated when a tall man stepped into Maggie's diner where I was enjoying my lunch. He stood about six feet five inches, had greasy black hair, and a crooked smile that contrasted with hollow eyes that held no kindness. He wore a denim jacket and a pair of worn-out jeans. There was something about this man that immediately sent chills down my spine. An air of intimidation and cruelty radiated from him in palpable waves. As luck would have it, my worst fears were realized when the tall man took a seat at the counter right next to me. Nervously finishing my meal, I tried my best to ignore his presence and pay my bill as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, though, I found my gaze drawn to a dark, reddish-brown stain on his once-white T-shirt which bore a striking resemblance streaked across the scene I'd passed earlier on the road. At that moment, 
as if sensing my observation or perhaps just out of spiteful curiosity, the tall man locked eyes with me. Instinctively recognizing that I'd seen something I shouldn't have, my first thought was to make a run for it. But I quickly dismissed that idea, realizing how ludicrous it would seem for me, a total stranger, to bolt based on some hunch. So instead, I steeled myself and forced a casual smile while leaving the diner. To say that I felt vulnerable would be an understatement. It was like having all eyes on me as I stepped into the sun outside Maggie's diner. The man watched me like a predator sizing up its prey but didn't make any sudden moves or follow me out onto the street. Determined not to look back and fuel any suspicions he may hold about me, I made my way around town trying to gather information from those who seemed less guarded than their fellow townsfolk. It became apparent quite quickly that something was amiss in Goldfield. People were either terrified or they tried to play things off as nothing out of the ordinary. There were whispers of missing persons, strange events that no one could explain, and quickly hushed conversations with sideways glances. It didn't take long for word to spread, as it does in small towns, that I'd been asking questions. Later that evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I found myself alone and walking back towards my parked rig. As I wandered through the quiet town at twilight, nerves quickly turned to panic when a figure emerged from the shadows behind me. The figure approached me, and as it came closer, I realized it was the tall man I had seen earlier in the diner. His appearance was intimidating a tall, muscular build with cold, calculating eyes and a gaze that could pierce through anyone. His face was weathered and scarred, each mark indicating a struggle he had fought at some point. The man had an air of danger about him, and there wasn't anything remotely supernatural about how menacing he felt. I know you've been asking questions around town, he said in a deep, gravelly voice. I stopped in my tracks, realizing that trying to run would only make things worse. I'm just passing through. I tried to explain. I don't want any trouble. The moment these words left my mouth, regret not at me for not calling for help or telling anyone about the suspicious figure earlier. Don't play dumb, he hissed. You saw something back there and now you're snooping around. Before I could respond, he lunged at me, grabbing hold of my arm tightly, his grip painfully cutting off circulation. Panic set in rapidly. This man wanted to silence me permanently, and I knew if I didn't react quickly, it would be my end. Let me go! I shouted, hoping someone nearby might hear. Unfortunately, the streets remained eerily empty. As I struggled against the man's unrelenting grasp, desperately trying to loosen his grip on my arm, I heard footsteps rapidly approaching from behind. Turning my head slightly to see who was coming towards us, fear turned into relief as two of Goldfield's local police officers rounded a nearby corner. The tall man suddenly released my arm and stepped back just as the two officers approached us. Already panting from pain and adrenaline coursing through me, words escaped me as they asked what had happened. The guy just attacked me. He has something to do with the disappearances in town. I managed to gasp between breaths. The police officers exchanged a glance, clearly unsure whether or not to believe me. But time was of the essence, and we didn't have a chance to discuss the matter further. The tall man had taken advantage of our distraction and sprinted away, quickly vanishing into darkness. Without another word, one officer took chase while the other stayed behind to gather more information from me. As I recounted the events since my arrival in Goldfield, the officer listened intently, understanding growing in his eyes. He then informed me that one of their own, Officer Mike Donovan, disappeared several weeks ago under similarly mysterious circumstances. Taking witness statements from both townsfolk and me, they gradually pieced together evidence that directly implicated the tall man and Mike's disappearance, 
and suspected involvement in other similar cases within their community. Three days later, after a thorough investigation and search led by Goldfields Law Enforcement, they found the tall man hiding out in an abandoned building on the outskirts of town. Cornered and clearly panicked, he violently attempted to resist arrest but was quickly overpowered by multiple officers before hurting anyone else. The tall man was found guilty of kidnapping and murdering Officer Mike Donovan along with two other missing persons after enough incriminating evidence was found at his hideout during a detailed search. The subsequent trial brought closure not only to Goldfield but also to grieving families who had relentlessly searched for answers regarding their loved one's disappearance. Feeling as though justice had been served and that Goldfield was a little safer now, I decided there was no point in staying any longer. I couldn't forget those fearful faces I encountered upon first arriving in town or Mike Donovan's death ripping the hearts of his family members open. But at least now they could begin healing, something they might not have been able to do if I hadn't stepped into the diner that fateful day. I remember it like it was yesterday, though time has a way of blurring things. My name is Franklin Greer. I'm a lifelong hunter in this sleepy Oregon town, and I had just bagged a large buck on my usual hunting grounds in the woods. Little did I know, my life was about to take a dark turn. As I dragged the buck toward my truck, something caught my eye. A shredded piece of clothing and a splash of blood on a nearby tree. My curiosity piqued. I decided to investigate further. Every instinct told me to walk away, but the thought of someone hurt and needing help made me push forward into the thick brush. The blood trail led me deeper into the woods, and eventually I stumbled upon what looked like a campsite turned nightmare. There were signs of struggle everywhere, broken branches and scattered belongings, but no people. A cold chill ran down my spine as I found what appeared to be human remains limbs torn off in grotesque ways. This wasn't natural. Something monstrous had caused this carnage. But I remained skeptical about the typical monsters pervasive in folklore. As daylight faded, a chilling howl echoed through the trees startled me. A creature emerged from the shadows, its enormous size and twisted features screaming against all logic or reason. The eyes were sunken and glowing an unnerving red hue while its teeth bore an unnerving resemblance to knives that glistened with fresh blood. It didn't speak or make any human-like gestures. Only snarls and growls filled its space. Against my better judgment, I raised my rifle. But before squeezing the trigger, something stopped me this creature had one very recognizable feature that connected it to the ongoing mystery it wore a strange medallion around its neck that belonged to one of the missing townsfolk from a recent news report what happened here in these woods didn't seem entirely random anymore this creature was not bound by the natural laws that governed my reality it was clear it had been stalking and hunting people with a gruesome efficiency that sent shivers down my spine. Thoughts raced through my head. Could this creature be taking revenge on behalf of the person whose medallion it wore? Or was it something darker, hunting for sport, pride, or sheer pleasure? It defied human comprehension. Gathering my wits, I decided to radio for help. I relayed my coordinates to the police and provided them with an obscure description of the situation. I knew they wouldn't believe me if I told them everything. Minutes dragged like hours, leaving me in nail-biting anticipation of their arrival. The creature swiftly turned its attention toward me, its eyes locking onto mine with an unsettling determination, as if sizing me up. My fingers sweat in anticipation around my rifle as it began to creep towards me with uncanny precision. 
Without warning, the creature lunged from a distance impossible for any human to master. I fired a shot but missed hitting only the twisted foliage behind it. Panic set in as it moved closer, its massive claws glinting menacingly in the fading light as if ready to give me a first-hand taste of the carnage left behind at the campsite. Every muscle in my body tensed up while sweat pulled around my collar and stinging in my eyes. The creature stopped inches from me, its hot breath fogging up my glasses as an intense hissing sound filled my ears. With no time left to consider my options, I tried to back away slowly from the creature, hoping not to incite an attack. The chances of me outrunning it were slim, but I needed to do something. One wrong move and it would tear me apart. In an unanticipated twist, another loud noise reverberated through the woods, the distant wailing of police sirens getting louder by the second. The creature reared back on its hind legs, its head whipping from side to side as it sensed the approaching threat. Taking advantage of its split-second distraction, I dove out of harm's way and scrambled behind a large tree trunk for cover. Hold your fire! I yelled frantically into the two-way radio, praying that the reinforcements would heed my warning before they unwittingly ended up as prey themselves. The police vehicles crashed into the clearing in a frenzied cacophony of lights and sirens. Officers tumbled out of their cars and began shouting commands, their weapons trained on the unpredictable beast before them. The creature hissed angrily in response, forming a horrifying tableau that only further heightened the mounting tension. Realizing that it couldn't take on so many armed opponents at once, it did something none of us expected it fled. Within seconds it had disappeared into the dense foliage without a trace. A collective sigh echoed among my fellow officers as gripping fear transformed into skeptical relief. All astonished gazes turned toward me, none more so than that of Officer Jenkins, who gaped at me in disbelief. In his thirty-year career patrolling this area, he'd never seen such a creature nor heard of anything remotely matching this hellish description. Johnson! What was that thing? He stammered as he slowly lowered his weapon. I couldn't provide an answer as I stared at where the terrifying creature once stood. Neither folklore expert nor wildlife biologist held relevant explanations for the nightmare that had just unfolded in front of us. Together, we examined the grisly remains of the campsite, careful to avoid any possible return of the creature. After combing through every inch of the area, we collected the necessary evidence and returned to our headquarters for further analysis. The department's biologists and zoologists pored over our findings for days, and yet no conclusion emerged on what type of creature we'd encountered. Though frustrating and unsettling, I found solace in knowing it seemed to have vanished from our jurisdiction and remained alive. Months later, in a quiet bar along a lonely highway far from where our initial confrontation took place, I shared my story with an old man who claimed to have seen creatures of an unknown origin during his youth. Though his accounts were vague on specifics, it felt comforting to confide in someone with similarly haunting experiences. We agreed that there will always be mysteries lurking beyond human understanding, mysteries that only pose danger when pursued and as dangerous as they are elusive. We parted ways that night, united by our unresolved questions and humble experiences with the unknown. As I drove home beneath the setting sun, I acknowledged the realization that some things are meant to stay hidden. In a world increasingly connected by technology and shared knowledge, it was perhaps best this creature remained an enigma known only to those who unknowingly crossed its path. Every once in a while, my thoughts drift back to those agonizing moments in the woods, specifically the vile essence emitted by that appalling creature and its cold reptilian eyes locked onto mine. That night's memories are deeply etched into my being, 
an eerie reminder of how fragile our reality can be when faced with something utterly beyond comprehension. I stepped out of my old pickup truck, feeling the crunchy gravel under my boots. My name is Koanamakwa, a native of the Anui Reservation. I've been living here all my life, working as a ranger for the local wildlife conservation program. The events that unfolded during that cryptic evening still haunt me to this day. The Anui Reservation was located in the breathtaking wilderness of Oregon, and I was tasked with patrolling the serene woodlands and dense forests, ensuring their protection from poachers and preserving these sacrosanct grounds. Although a physically taxing and occasionally tedious job, it aligned perfectly with my passion for nature and preserving our cultural heritage. Assembled at the community center were the reservation's search and rescue volunteers, including Jessa, an old friend I hadn't seen in years. She'd become a skilled tracking individual after joining the program to find her missing cousin many years ago. We decided to catch up as we set off on our mission to locate a young boy named Matto who had gone missing. The dense woodland surrounded us like a veil. Our walk progressed relatively uneventfully as we trekked through the underbrush, recounting old memories and enjoying each other's company. Jessa cracked jokes about how my humor hadn't changed over the years. However, it didn't take long for this seemingly ordinary search and rescue operation to take a sinister turn. We stumbled upon a gruesome scene in areas strewn with remnants of clothing and personal items accompanied by evident signs of struggle carved into the earth. Grimacing at our discovery, we followed these newfound indicators without hesitation. As we ventured further into the woods, night had begun to swallow our surroundings. Fading sunlight was replaced by shadows stretching their fingers across our path. It wasn't long before we heard screams echoing through the trees, making our hearts race in fear. Adrenaline coursing through our veins, we sprinted towards the source, only to discover a mangled, unrecognizable corpse in a small clearing. Though devastated by the sight before us, we couldn't shake the growing feeling that we were being watched. Suddenly, Jess's radio crackled to life with an urgent message from another search party member, stuttering and panicked, describing an animalistic creature stalking them from afar. They'd never encountered anything like it before. The creature was hunched over, appearing partially human but with a twisted and distorted form covered in a thick, dark fur. Replacing the radio on her hip without uttering a word, Jessa glanced nervously back at me. Calls for help were issued to local law enforcement, but due to our remote location, they wouldn't be able to reach us quickly enough. I carefully unholstered my service pistol as we ventured onward, more alert than ever, knowing full well that this sinister beast might have its sights set on us as its next meal. From this point on, our apprehensive chatter faded as we focused on survival and rescuing whomever else might still be lost in these ominous woods. After what seemed like an eternity of creeping through the chilling darkness, we heard rustling in the dense foliage ahead. Bracing ourselves for the worst, I raised my gun and aimed at whatever monstrosity was waiting for us. Suddenly emerging from the shadows was not our predator but rather a terrified Matto bruised and bloodied but alive. We leaped into action, retrieving him from the forest floor with haste. We supported Matto, helping him walk as we cautiously made our way back toward the rendezvous point. We had no other choice but to continue through the darkness of the forest, knowing that the creature could still be stalking our path. The radio crackled again, and this time Jessa's voice broke as she relayed that another search party member, Dan, had been killed by the creature. His mutilated body found sprawled across the forest floor. She warned us to be on high alert, and reminded us that help was still several hours away. 
We had to survive until then. As we moved deeper into the woods with Mada leaning heavily on both of us for support, we started hearing soft growls echoing in the distance. The sounds seemed to come from all sides, disorienting us and sending chills down our spines. Though Mado had no strength left to speak due to his injuries, his eyes reflected a terror beyond words. We tried our best to move quickly and carefully through the uneven terrain, but we knew that stealth might not be enough with such a relentless hunter on our heels. Suddenly, a guttural roar pierced the night air. It was closer than before much closer. Before I could react, I felt an immense force smash into my back, knocking me off my feet and onto the cold ground. I quickly realized that I dropped my gun upon impact. Scrambling desperately in search of it, I could see Jessa standing over Mado protectively as he struggled to get up. The creature lunged at them from behind a thicket of trees, its twisted form barely obscured by shadows. It snarled viciously at Jessa and reached out with its long claws narrowly missing her as she evaded just in time. It was clear this beast was smarter than any animal we had ever encountered. I finally located my gun only inches from my hand and quickly aimed at the creature. I fired multiple rounds at its hulking form in a desperate attempt to bring it down. It howled in pain, backing away for the moment. We knew our chances of survival were slim. With Mado injured, we couldn't outrun this terrible beast. At best, we could hope for an opportunity to find cover or perhaps somehow outsmart what lay within the darkness. The radio crackled again with Jess's contact on the other end, urging us to hold on just a little longer as reinforcements were on their way. An eternity seemed like a small price to pay, but it was all we had left. The creature was relentless. Over the course of hours, it continued to stalk and attack us whenever we let our guard down. We did everything in our power to slow it down, even setting makeshift traps, using whatever was readily available around us. But its resilience seemed uncanny. With every injury inflicted, it would simply retreat momentarily into the shadows before emerging with renewed ferocity. Our fight with the beast raged on through the night until finally, in the distant horizon we saw dawn begin to break through the canopy above. It was only then that help arrived armed officers stormed through the area, their footsteps thunderous as they closed in on our location. The creature seemed to sense its impending doom and hesitated for a brief moment before disappearing back into the darkness of the forest one last time. In those final tense moments before law enforcement swarmed our makeshift campsite and whisked Maddo off for medical treatment, I tried to piece together everything that had happened. The gruesome battle left us physically and mentally scarred. Our search for a missing person turned into a nightmare beyond comprehension a sinister creature that bore no resemblance to any known species terrorized us for an entire night. It took weeks for local wildlife experts and law enforcement agencies to conclude their investigation, but they were unable to identify or track down the creature. Its existence remained a chilling mystery that haunted the entire community. As for Jessa, Maddo, and me, our lives would never be the same again forever carrying with us the unshakable memory of the terrifying beast that stalked us relentlessly and claimed poor Dan's life. We wanted desperately to forget those dark hours in the forest, but some things can never truly be forgotten. This happened to me a while ago, right before I took shelter from the pouring rain under the thick canopy of trees in Carson National Forest, New Mexico. I'm Clyde Orborn, an outdoorsman and adventure seeker. A series of unexplained events started right after I met Ermintra Giles, 
a fascinating forester who shared with me the legend of strange disappearances in these woods. Just days later, the local sheriff requested our help in finding Roscoe Nunez, a missing hiker. As we searched for him together, we stumbled upon something gut-wrenching, a cold and lifeless body with unnatural bite marks. Feeling uneasy, I hesitated at first to share my suspicion that a monstrous creature was at large. Some nights passed before the whispers around town intensified. There was definitely something lurking here. They called it the Bone Breaker, or so the story went from father to son. The creature hunted humans but vanished between generations. I decided to take action and gathered a search team that included Ermintrud and our new acquaintance Soren Brabson. We scoured through the thick forest foliage under the moonlit sky, looking for any traces of this ominous creature. As we walked deeper into the woods armed with guns and hunting knives, our conversation lightened the mood with laughs and exchanges of amusing anecdotes. But suddenly, we came across tracks in the mud, tracks unlike those of any known animal in these parts. My heart pounded as we followed them cautiously. The sounds of nature gradually diminished, replaced by eerie silence. Soon enough, we heard heavy breathing emerging from behind a thick growth of bushes. These were events no man could forget. The scent still fills my nostrils burning wood mixed with blood-curdling terror. The swiftness and intensity shook us to our core as we watched this vicious creature reveal itself from the shadows. In all its gruesome glory stood a figure of nightmares, tall and muscular, with elongated arms ending in cruel claws. Coarse fur concealed its repulsive face, displaying a snout full of razor-sharp teeth dripping with saliva, an unspeakable version of devastation. Before we could react, it roared and charged us in a swift instance. Its talons ripped through the flesh of my arm as I barely escaped its grasp, firing my gun into its imposing form. The creature screeched loudly. I'd wounded it. As we backed away cautiously, Amintra dropped her firearm, startled by the rage of the beast. Desperation consumed her eyes as she realized the danger surrounding us all. I won't let you take another life, she screamed wildly at the creature. The monster didn't attack. Instead, it closed its eyes and breathed heavily. Was it in pain? Ermintrud stared it down before turning to me with urgency. Clyde, she whispered harshly. Roscoe is still out there somewhere. I have to save him. Panic settled in as I helped Soren up who had been knocked down by the massive force of the creature's charge. We debated whether to risk moving forward or retreat and gather reinforcements, but an agonizing scream echoed through the forest from afar. Our hearts raced with fear and adrenaline as we knew we had to act quickly, unable to fathom what horrors awaited us deeper into the treacherous woods. We couldn't waste any more time. Armintra darted into the woods, and Soren and I followed close behind. We scurried through the dense forest, pain and fright fueling our steps. The vile creature let out a blood-curdling squeal that echoed through the trees, prompting us to quicken our pace. As we hurried further into the unknown, I felt something brush against my leg, a cell phone. Quickly snagging it from the ground, I glanced at the screen. It was Roscoe's. Armintrud! I called to her. I found Roscoe's cell phone. Her eyes widened with determination, and we pushed on through the forest, frantically calling his name between heaving breaths. The creature continued its pursuit, spots of blood marking its path where my gunshot had left a wound. In a brave attempt to increase our chance of survival, Soren suddenly veered off to the left, drawing the creature's attention away from us as he yelled obscenities in its direction. With both a new sense of hope and dread sinking in, we realized this could be our last chance to find Roscoe alive. Soon enough, 
we stumbled upon a small clearing with Roscoe lying there motionless. Blood had stained his clothes. It was apparent that he'd been mauled by the monster. No! Armintrud cried as she dropped to her knees beside him. She tried calling for help on Roscoe's phone but discovered it was out of service. There was no reception deep within the woods. With reluctance and pain clouding her eyes, Armintrud agreed with me that our best course of action would be to leave him in this makeshift haven and search for help beyond the tree lean. Just as we began our retreat towards safety, a horrifying howl rang out again. Soren must have reached his limit. Fear and despair clawed their way into our minds, propelling us forward with as much speed as our battered bodies could muster. We were growing weaker by the second. Out of nowhere, Ermintrud stopped abruptly, causing me to collide with her. Just ahead of us, we saw Soren's limp body tossed from the trees and land with a sickening crunch. The monstrous beast emerged then, blood smeared across its snout. In a desperate attempt to defend ourselves, I grabbed the nearest rock and hurled it at the creature, striking it in the head. As it roared angrily, Armintrud tackled it and stabbed its wounded side with a jagged stick she'd found on the ground. The creature thrashed about in pain as it tried to shake her off. It suddenly collapsed to the ground, catching all of us off guard. As I stood paralyzed, my mind raced. What had caused the creature's unexpected fall? Armintrud panted heavily while still gripping her crude weapon tightly. In that moment of confusion and salvation, we assessed the following. The creature must have been a shapeshifter or akin to something like a skinwalker based on the myths we had heard from others before coming here. However, we dared not investigate further. We knew nothing about these legends nor this monstrous thing before us. All that mattered was getting back to civilization and proper care for our wounded friends. As swiftly as our injured states allowed, we exited the treacherous woods and soon emerged onto a road where several cars passed by. Flagging one down wasn't easy as many drivers regarded our bloodied figures with caution. At last, an older gentleman pulled over and cautiously helped us into his car. While he drove us toward town in search of medical assistance, neither Amintra nor I could find words to express our thoughts. We grieved silently for Roscoe and Soren, the friends we couldn't save, as we stared blankly out the window, recalling their faces in happier times. The nightmare that had consumed us had finally ended, and yet we still felt its gnarled claws haunting our hearts. For now, survival would have to suffice. I sat on the porch of my cabin in the Montana woods, reminiscing about my childhood days in this very place. I missed old times when I played hide-and-seek with my friend, Arnold Bishop. The sun was setting, casting a warm orange glow over the forest. As I walked inside to make dinner, I remembered the local legend that circulated about a mysterious creature lurking deep within the woods. People claimed it was a ferocious beast that attacked anyone who crossed its path. I had always dismissed the story as nonsense. I dialed my friend Cornelius Robbins, who lived nearby, for a friendly chat before dinner. As we spoke, we both heard what sounded like a distant howl. Cornelius laughed it off as probably a wild animal, but something about it unsettled me. Later that night, I heard footsteps outside. Grabbing my flashlight and shotgun, I stepped outside to investigate. Momentarily shining the light past my cabin towards an ominous shadow that darted away into the darkness. After finding nothing of interest and shrugging it off as wildlife, I returned indoors to rest. The next morning, there was an eerie silence within the woods, no chirping of birds or rustling leaves. 
Concerned for Cornelius' safety after our discussion last night, I decided to follow protocol and check in with him personally. As I approached Cornelius' house, something felt amiss. The door swung open without resistance. Inside lay Cornelius' lifeless body on the floor with deep gashes in his chest. Terror rose within me as I witnessed this gruesome scene and realized that whatever caused this, animal or human, was still loose in the woods. Panicking, I phoned Leah Montgomery, another trusted friend from town who served on the local search and rescue team. We needed a plan if we were going to find out what was responsible for this horrific crime. We agreed to meet later that day with some of her fellow team members and prepare ourselves for an investigation. As we delved deeper into the woods, the air felt heavier, and our unease grew. A team member named Ned Thorne pointed out signs of disturbance and odd claw marks in the trees. He commented on how strange this was for wildlife in the area. As we continued, I shared snippets of my past with Leah to distract ourselves from the growing tension between us. Suddenly we stumbled upon a horrific scene, four brutally mutilated bodies scattered around a clearing. Whoever or whatever had caused this chaos was powerful and ruthless. From a distance, we heard screeching that sent chills down our spines. It seemed that the chilling legend wasn't so far-fetched after all. We swept the area in search of weapons or evidence as to what could have done this, but we found nothing conclusive. The realization dawned on us. It was no animal or human behind this carnage. It was something more sinister. Quickly our party radioed for backup as we cautiously pushed forward. We registered each gruesome finding coupled with strange footprints leading us further into the unknown territory. As twilight set in, a guttural howl echoed through the trees again, closer this time. Gripping my shotgun tighter, I knew that whatever nightmare lurked in these woods now hunted us too. Sweating profusely from being on constant alert, I turned to my team to ensure they were still attentive. Instinct told me we needed to change tactics. If we grouped together too closely, it would be easier for whatever monstrous creature stalked us to pick us off one by one. We spread out while maintaining visual contact as best as possible in these closing shadows. The eerie silence had now intensified since our departure this morning. Only snapping twigs and nervous breaths pierced sporadically through the darkness that loomed heavily around. The air bore a foul stench that only heightened the tension that was already palpable. Behind me, Leah suddenly cried out in horror, her flashlight flailing wildly upon discovering another blood-drenched corpse. Instinctively our flurry of light beams converged, and at last we caught a fleeting glimpse of our monstrous assailant, a grotesquely hideous creature with a ghastly maw full of massive teeth and equipped with long sharp claws unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. The creature let out a deafening screech as it disappeared back into the darkness, leaving us all trembling. We knew there was no time to waste we had to get away before it came back. Move now! I shouted, motioning for the others to follow my lead. We began to retrace our steps, attempting to navigate through the dense forest as fast as possible without losing sight of one another. Our frantic pace slowed when we reached the earlier corpse and saw among it a tattered map and radio. With no other options or guidance of finding our way out, I instructed everyone to check their pockets for flares. Even though the creature would likely be attracted to the bright light, it was necessary for rescuers to find us. Okay, Tom yelled over after checking his bag. I got four flares. That should last us a while. He wasted no time lighting one up casting an eerie red glow against the trees while trying to get some bearings on our location using the damaged map. Suddenly, we heard the creature's roar echoing through the woods again. It sounded like it was getting closer. 
We decided to follow the path even deeper into unknown territory while continuing with our flares and hoping for rescue. We made our way through rocky terrain and overgrown bushes as quickly and cautiously as possible. The mix of dread and adrenaline made it difficult for anyone to speak or communicate effectively beyond short bursts of imperative dialogue. Everyone took turns watching each other's backs, but there was no denying that hopelessness had begun to seep in as fatigue also set in. After what felt like hours, however, an opening appeared before us, a series of caverns that offered some temporary shelter from our monstrous assailant. I couldn't shake off those images of carnage witnessed earlier, nor could I stop wondering about what vile purpose this creature served in order to inflict such horror within these woods. As we all entered the cavern, we agreed to stay there to regain our strength and hopefully lower the chance of the creature locating us. Meanwhile, Tom continued to fiddle with the radio found earlier, trying desperately to establish a connection with the backup team we'd initially called for. Static was all that emitted from the device at first, but after persistent adjustments, a faint voice finally broke through. Hello? Can you hear us? Tom said in hushed and anxious urgency. We're inside some caverns, and we need help immediately. Our coordinates are. He hastily relayed our location as indicated on the map. The voice on the other end confirmed they had received our transmission and were sending a rescue party straight away. Relieved at getting through, our focus shifted to protecting ourselves from the creature until help could arrive. With only two flares remaining, we strategized how to stretch them out while conserving whatever energy we had left as time grew tedious. It seemed like an eternity until Tom's radio crackled again with news that the rescue team was nearby. As we prepared to exit the caverns and make ourselves known to our rescuers, a blood-curdling scream reverberated inside the chamber, shaking us to our cores. To our horror, one of us was missing, Leah, who had been standing near the mouth of one of the caves. My heart pounding, I looked around at my remaining terrified team members. It didn't take long for us all to deduce what had happened. The creature had stalked us right into these caverns and snatched Leah away when she'd least expected it. I motioned for everyone else to remain quiet and keep their weapons ready as we slowly approached where Leah's last agonizing cry emerged from. As we braced for an attack from our relentless foe, I couldn't help but wonder if this ordeal was ever going to end on anything resembling a positive note. Emerging from the caverns, the rescue team was in sight, and they were well armed and prepared to face whatever lay within the woods. As we joined forces with them, we solemnly recounted the gruesome events we had endured, acknowledging Leah's tragic loss. Now united, we vowed to track down and hopefully subdue this monstrous foe, not just for ourselves but in honor of our fallen comrades. And perhaps, deep down inside me, I wondered if this confrontation could offer some closure for this ghastly chapter of our lives. I woke up with a headache, feeling groggy from last night's party. My name is Gregor Samzer, and I am a journalist living in a small town called Edgewood in New Mexico. It was supposed to be just a simple life for me after leaving my high-pressure job in the city. I never expected my quiet life to take such a dark turn. I decided to go for a walk in the nearby Edgewood Nature Preserve to clear my head and enjoy the afternoon sun. As I walked down the trail, I stumbled upon a small gathering of locals. They seemed upset, discussing something serious, so I went over and asked what was going on. I learned that somebody named Randolph Geisel had been found brutally murdered early this morning not far from where we stood. Intrigued by this unexpected event in our peaceful town, I decided to dig deeper. 
A police officer told me that Randolph had been torn apart, as if by an animal, yet there were no known predators capable of inflicting such damage in our area. My investigative instincts kicked in and I needed to get to the bottom of this. As days went by, similar attacks occurred, and townspeople started whispering about a humanoid wolf creature prowling the night. Each victim seemed to have been killed differently, some impaled on tree branches, others eviscerated or skeletonized where they stood. I began interviewing witnesses and searching for any remaining evidence at each crime scene. But despite my extensive efforts, nothing conclusive came up. The once comforting community started spiraling into paranoia as they bolted their doors at night and peered suspiciously at anyone who dared venture outside after dark. My best friend Ernestine Feidler confided in me one day that her sister had gone missing some years ago under similar circumstances when they were just children, only her body was never found. She pleaded with me to continue investigating, convinced that the past and present killings were somehow connected to the same killer. Over time, I began to notice a pattern. Each victim had a connection with the woods, either as a park ranger, hiker, or nature enthusiast. Slowly but surely, this creature had woven its twisted web throughout our town, staining our once beautiful land with blood and terror. Weeks turned into months, and still, no one caught the monster responsible. One fateful evening at the local bar, I caught wind of a hunter who had gone deep into the woods and claimed to have seen it with his own eyes. Desperate for answers, I sought him out. His name was Jacob Keynes, and his story was chilling. Jacob described being out hunting when he came across a gruesome scene. Animal carcasses littered the ground like a macabre buffet. As he tried to make sense of what he found, an eerie silence fell around him before being shattered by spine-chilling howls accompanied by heavy footfalls. Suddenly, he found himself staring down the humanoid wolf creature, easily over six feet tall with thick gray fur and eyes that glowed an unnatural red. Terrified for his life but refusing to back down, Jacob raised his rifle and fired, yet the creature seemed unfazed by his attempts. Within seconds of realizing that his bullets couldn't stop it from charging towards him, Jacob made a mad dash back toward town and managed to escape. From that day on, I knew there was no stopping this beast by conventional means. I spent countless hours researching all manner of folklore for any clue on how to defeat it when every logical route seemed pointless. My work has become increasingly dangerous as my investigations take me deeper into territories known only by whispered rumors, graveyards where even birds dare not sing and dark corners where shadows breathe life into nightmares. One evening while gathering evidence from another grisly scene, I stumbled across an oddity, wolf-like paw prints mixed with human footprints leading me through the woods. As I tried to make sense of what I found, I experienced an unsettling feeling that told me it knew I was there, stalking my movements and waiting for the right moment to strike. No stranger to fear and determined to use my journalistic skills to bring light into the darkest corners. I pressed on with my investigation despite knowing the grave danger that loomed over me. My time spent researching the incidents yielded no answers, only more questions. People went missing without a trace, and I found myself in mortal danger every time I ventured too close to the creature's hunting grounds. It was a grim reality that called for desperate measures. Unbeknownst to me, Others in town were also investigating this threat. We had all recognized the unique human footprints that often surrounded the crime scenes and started covertly communicating and sharing information through coded letters. Through a collective effort, we began connecting the dots. One member identified a pattern of disappearances coinciding with full moons, leading us to suspect that the person responsible was suffering from lycanthropy. 
believing that any sign of panic might alert the creature, therefore putting our lives at even greater risk, none of us dared to call for help. Over time, we concluded that the beast must have been humanoid, meaning it maintained its human form during daylight hours. Determined to unmask this brutal killer, we clandestinely patrolled areas where recent attacks had occurred. Several nervous nights passed before I spotted the creature changing from its human form beneath the moonlit sky. To my terror, it was none other than Jacob, my lifelong friend and innocent witness to earlier attacks, who transformed into this vicious monster right before my eyes. Memories flashed through my mind, our shared childhood adventures, impossibly distant now from the horrible image that stood before me. I attempted to remain unnoticed as hope fired within me. If I could identify the creature in its human form, perhaps I could find a way to stop it or somehow save Jacob from himself. Observing from afar on subsequent nights, I discovered that Jacob suffered immensely during his transformations between man and beast. It looked as though each shift tormented his soul and ravaged his body. In one such instance, when he howled out in pain during a transformation back into his human form, I mustered some courage and called out to him. At first, he didn't recognize me, disoriented and consumed by the anguish that his curse had brought upon him. But eventually, he recognized my voice and listened as I told him about our fears and the evidence that implicated him as the horrifying creature together with other townspeople who were willing to risk their lives to end this horror, we began researching ways to cure lycanthropy. Our findings led us to discover a desperate, heart-wrenching option, one that required the afflicted to willingly partake in an ancient ritual involving the shedding of their own blood before offering it as a symbol of repentance. Unable to bear watching my friend suffer any longer, I hesitantly informed Jacob of our findings. He reacted with a mix of relief and anguish. Eager for escape from his torment yet fearful of what the ritual entailed, he agreed nonetheless to take the chance. The night we performed the ritual, Jacob's cries echoed through the darkness as he sanctified his blood upon the black stone altar we had prepared on the outskirts of town. The air grew heavy with tension and apprehension. None of us knew if this would ultimately work or condemn us all. After a seemingly endless moment of unbearable silence, Jacob released a final scream before collapsing next to the altar. His tremors eased and his breathing steadied. As dawn broke, it seemed that our efforts had worked. His lycanthropic transformation cycle had been broken. In the aftermath of Jacob's ordeal, our group disbanded secretly swearing never to speak of what we'd done or witnessed. We buried our knowledge so deeply that none would ever suspect our connection to those horrifying events. We looked after one another in unspoken camaraderie, torn between guilt for what Jacob had endured at our hands and relief at having protected others from meeting their end at the claws of a beast we still couldn't fully comprehend. Gone were the days of being hunted, and yet I often found myself gazing at the moon on clear nights, my heart heavy with the memory of terror and sacrifice. Would I ever forget those events? Could I ever truly enjoy life knowing what darkness lay within so close, and that Jacob's freedom from the curse was only ever a heartbeat away? No. In truth, those nights would haunt me forever, their gruesome events indelibly etched into my very being, a constant reminder that underneath the surface, one might always be at risk of becoming prey to a nightmare far worse than any legend or ancient tale. The silence of the Wyoming wilderness was sacred to me, a lone fire lookout named Penn stationed at the Huckleberry Fire Tower. Summers here were tranquil, though sometimes the isolation wore thin on my patience. Thirteen weeks in, 
With only the radio and an ever-present expanse of green for company, life could become mundane. Then came the broken twigs. A pattern of steps too heavy, too deliberate to be any local wildlife I knew. It began as a distant curiosity, but soon these signs marked a calculated trail leading far too close to my tower. I'd learned in my solitary service that nature lived by unwritten but inviolable laws. What moved out there now seemed uninhibited by such rules. The shift from curiosity to concern was punctuated by a discovery that summer's Thursday wouldn't let me forget. During a routine perimeter check, the underbrush revealed what only could be called an altar, mounds of earth adorned with the remains of deer all arranged in methodical chaos. No predator I knew took trophies or paid homage. Fear is a weighty thing when you're miles from anyone who might hear you scream. Chet, the off-season ranger, was quick on the radio when I called in my findings. Gruff voice crackling through static, he dismissed it as poachers with peculiar habits. But Chet didn't see the precision in those placements didn't smell the iron tang hanging thick like fog among the trees. I'll come up and take a look tomorrow, was his final word on it before signing off with his usual unnecessary joke about how being scared of Bambi seemed unbecoming of a fire lookout named Penn. The night did nothing to ease tensions. There are sounds one expects alone in the woods nocturnal creatures making known their existence yet this was different. Rhythmic scratches against what echoed up to my lofty sanctuary, labored breathing heavy enough that each exhale seemed a whisper against my tower's windows. The creature, because surely this was no man, was always just out of sight yet felt oppressively close. Its presence was invasive and intimate, an intruder one can feel but not fend off. My name may have been Penn, but I wrote no letters home composed no wills or goodbyes when dawn bled through night's shroud and I saw it, the creature, clearly for the first time at Woodland's Edge. Large beyond bare size yet hunched unnaturally and covered in matted fur, or maybe clothing. It watched me under quivering hands that almost mimicked prayer. When Chet finally arrived later that day, his jocular demeanor faltered upon witnessing whatever it left behind just where dirt met timber, heavy footprints surrounding my tower, deep enough to suggest both heft and perhaps intent. We ventured together back to yesterday's grotesque shrine only to find further manifestations, more displays featuring flora interwoven with fauna bones, now fresher than before and unsettlingly humanoid in structure. With weapons useless against an entity so foreign to our knowledge, we decided escape would be prudent until proper authorities could investigate. But retreat proved challenging as every trail appeared compromised with signs that this creature didn't simply roam. It understood strategy, a terrifying implication. Eyes taut with unshared panic, we planned our cautious extrication from Huckleberry Tower under watchful pines weighed down by more than snow prelude. Chet and I made it down the tower. We kept silent, our steps careful. The forest surrounded us, dense and alive with threat. We had no signal here, no way to call for help. Isolation was our enemy as much as the creature was. Should we split up? Chet whispered. No, I replied. It's what it wants. We marched hour upon hour. Hunger clawed at our bellies, fear at our resolve. Then a crash echoed through the trees behind us. Twigs snapped, leaves rustled. Run! I shouted. We surged forward, hearts pounding, the creature's growls reverberating after us. Sweat soaked my shirt as we reached a clearing. An old truck sat there, abandoned but hopeful. We scrambled inside and were soon careening down the path, the engine roaring defiance at our pursuer. Days passed before help arrived local authorities, armed and cautious. They found no creature but reported our find, 
five bodies deep in the woods near Huckleberry Tower, torn apart, unrecognizable as if defiled by anger or hunger or both. A journal lay among them, pages filled with sightings of a large figure stalking these woods for years, its behavior more cunning than any known animal. Now here I sit at home, safe but not at peace, knowing something walks those trees, a creature unknown but undeniably real and lethal. And tonight, even back in civilization's embrace, I hear a faint rustling outside my window reminiscent of those fearful nights escaping an almost certain fate. Yet this is only the wind, isn't it? The fire lookout tower perched atop the ridgeline in Mount Hood National Forest offered a panoramic view of the wilderness. This was my kingdom, or so I liked to pretend during the long shifts. My name is Tobias Rundle, and I've been reporting smoke and potential fires for a little over three years. It's a life of solitude, just me, my thoughts, and the unending stretch of trees. A radio crackled to life with weather updates one calm winter evening when the woods seemed to hold their breath in hushed anticipation. First snowfall was nigh, a time when visitors thinned out and forest critters started burrowing in for warmth. That's when I heard it first, what sounded like howling from the depths of the woods below, lost whispers carried by the wind. Not animalistic, but human, if that made sense. I gripped the edge of my chart table after radioing in to report. No hiker should be out this time of year not when night temperatures plummeted fast. I decided to investigate at dawn. The name Sullivan crossed my mind, an old-timer who lived alone at the edge of the thicket and often spun tales of things best left unseen in the forests over his harrowingly strong moonshine. As morning broke through with muted rays illuminating frost-tipped pines, I strapped on snowshoes and descended towards Sullivan's place. Each step crunched underfoot with a rhythmic certainty. The air bit my cheeks. It had turned bitter overnight. What met me was not Sullivan standing by his porch ready with a tail or two, but silence and blood. It started at his doorstep and disappeared into the treeline like morbid breadcrumbs. My heart raced as I stepped into the pines following each scarlet drop. This was no predator's doing. They drag their catch, not leave these deliberate droplets leading somewhere. It didn't take long to deduce that someone had been after Sullivan. But why? And where were they leading him? I didn't need to wait long for an answer. Something shuffled between trees up ahead, limping into view with Sullivan thrown over its broad shoulders like caught game. Close enough now, I could see our antagonist. Not a creature from nightmares or legend, but a man large and build wearing what looked distressingly like hunter's gear. Hey! I shouted without thinking. Only too late did I register his large caliber rifle slung across his back. No normal hunting rifle either. He dropped Sullivan's inert form unceremoniously before turning to me, his eyes cold as slate. In that moment, everything came together. Missing persons reports over recent months, rumors among locals about a hunter taking trophies in perverse ways. His laugh broke ice and shattered calm as he shrugged off his heavy coat revealing a blood-drenched shirt underneath. You reckon you'll survive to report this? I turned and ran. My phone was at home. This man needed fleeing, not confronting. Trees blurred by as I sprinted out of the forest. He was behind me, his presence huge and menacing. Reaching my porch, I bolted inside and locked the door. Hands shaking, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. The operator's voice calmed me as I explained about Sullivan and the man in the woods. They sent officers immediately. In minutes, police cars arrived. The officers examined Sullivan, 
He was alive but unconscious. They called for an ambulance then fanned out into the trees. Hours later, they found no trace of the man. Forensics came to collect samples from Sullivan's clothes, the hunter's blood perhaps, and evidence to find him by. The town held a vigil for Sullivan. While he recovered in the hospital, we mourned those missing, hoping for closure but fear lurked in whispers among us. That creature, the man, remained uncaught, yet people spoke about animal traits he displayed, unusually strong with senses alert like a wild thing. We were all victims now, of paranoia and loss. We didn't walk alone at night, and we double-checked our locks. The blood on my neighbor's porch reminded us every day until rain washed it away, but nothing could cleanse the scar that day left on our small town. My first week working at Denali National Park in Alaska should have been about learning trails tracking wildlife, and helping visitors. Instead, it turned into something I can't quite explain. My name is Callum Nevis, and I've been a park ranger for five years now, but nothing in my past experience could have prepared me for what happened here. I met the rest of the team my first day, Marta Haynes and Jasper Knox, seasoned rangers who seemed to know every whisper of the wind through these vast taigas and imposing mountains. We hit it off quickly after I cracked a joke about getting lost on my way to the restroom. On a routine patrol, we came across an abandoned campsite off the beaten path. Tents were shredded, belongings scattered as if a twister had passed through but the trees stood unperturbed around us. Storm didn't do this, Jasper muttered, picking up a tattered backpack. Marta examined deep gashes in the tent fabric. Let's check for missing persons. There were none reported. We split up to cover more ground. I was to follow the trail leading away from the campsite for any clues. A few hours in, I noticed peculiar tracks unlike any animal I'd ever seen or studied three-toed with claw marks that dug deep into the earth as they headed towards a dense part of the forest. Pushing through underbrush so thick sunlight hardly pierced it, that impending sense of unease became tangible. The forest was silent, too silent, until a crunch echoed not far from where I stood. Turning, there was only the thick foliage looking back at me. Callum? You see anything? Marta's voice crackled over the radio. The silence clung close again after my response, no further disturbance but an increasing dread that crawled under my skin. Follow protocol. If there's danger, call it in. A roar shattered the calm, sending birds into frenzied flight. It reverberated through trees and bones alike while I stood frozen trying to discern its source. No known creature made such sounds in these woods. It defied what logic dictated inhabits this part of Alaska. Jasper radioed next, urgency palpable even through static. Something's out here. I heard it too. Marta added with gravity that cemented my resolve to regroup. Making my way back to them wasn't easy. The forest seemed alive with shadows dancing just at the periphery of vision my imagination, surely. That's when I saw it between gnarled tree trunks, hulking form moving with deliberate malevolence, dark fur matted with something viscous, eyes that caught what little light seeped through and reflected back nothingness, claws that seemed capable of rendering metal let alone flesh. I did not stick around to exchange pleasantries or ponder on its diet preferences but turned tail and ran faster than during any training or emergency drill before it. Spotting Jasper and Marta ahead by sheer luck more than intent, I motioned them toward me with vehement gestures but refrained from shouting lest we draw its attention once more. We need to leave. 
was all I managed between jagged breaths as we moved towards our vehicle parked miles away at our starting point that morning. They did not argue knowing all too well survival trumped curiosity in these moments. We contacted local law enforcement, a futile act deep down we all acknowledge, but protocol demanded action even when you can't articulate who or what you're reporting beyond something predatory. We kept pace, moving through the underbrush. Branches snapped underfoot. I glanced back once. It lurked there, a tangle of darkness and intent. Its stature towered above the tallest brush, muscles coiled under a mass of fur. The separate entities that made up its form became one as it moved in silence, a fluid nightmare. Jasper pointed to a distant glow, our vehicle's headlamps. There! We pushed on, lungs burning. I hit the open door button on my key fob frantically. The lights blinked. Doors unlocked with a welcoming chime. It burst from the tree line, hind legs propelling it forward with force that shook the earth beneath us. Run! I yelled. We leapt into the vehicle. Jasper slammed the ignition, engine roaring to life. Marta, in the back seat, slammed her door shut mere seconds before it launched at the side, claws tearing deep gouges into metal like it was clay. We spun tires on the dirt floor speeding away leaving behind a cloud of dust and the echoing cries of our attacker fading with distance. We drove in silence until we reached civilization, or what passed for it out here. Its features remained imprinted in my mind, claws that shred metal, eyes devoid of light or soul, movements harboring ill intent without a sound. Law enforcement derived in bafflement at our description, too large for any native species, too silent for any known predator, too agile for something its size. We recounted our account to disbelief, questions without answers, but we knew what we witnessed despite lacking an explanation. The following days saw us returning to ordinary routines, yet that stretch of forest became forbidden territory governed by an unseen ruler that ruled through fear rather than law. Our research provided no clarity on its identity larger than any bear yet silent as a cat, for matted not by neglect but battle or necessity. It became our shared burden, knowledge of something beyond understanding lurking amongst familiar landscapes. No one returned to that forest. Stories circulated as whispers amongst locals of something feral concealed within those woods turning curiosity to caution and respect for boundaries unseen yet understood. As time passed the creature became less story and more myth yet none forgot those who witnessed its reality nor did they tempt fate by asking questions best left unanswered lest they invite gaze upon themselves from something better left in shadow and speculation. My name is Carl Drayton, and there's comfort in the hum of an 18-wheeler on a long stretch of highway. As a trucker, I've traversed the labyrinth of roads that crisscross the country, each haul a testament to my commitment to keep America moving. The evening in question found me navigating the rugged landscapes near Moab, Utah, the fading twilight casting vast shadows across the red rock formations. The radio spat out bits and pieces of a tune as I made my way toward the secluded service station that marked my rest stop. The place was a relic from a bygone era, an aging fuel pump, a rundown diner barely clinging to dignity. Resting there was routine, comfort and repetition kept me grounded. It was Ted who ran the joint, a giant of a man with hands like shovels and a mop of hair that never seemed combed. You look like you've been through hell, Carl, Ted remarked with his usual nonchalance as I lumbered in for a coffee alternative, a soda that was two parts ice, one part syrupy caffeine. Feels like it. I managed to chuckle, 
setting down onto one of the vinyl booths that had seen better days. The quiet of night enveloped the place as truck engines cooled outside. But that evening harbored no peace. Around midnight, a peculiar silence settled in, an absence interrupted by screeching tires in the distance. Confusion spread across Ted's face. We never heard such ruckus this late. I stepped out to investigate, only for my heart to jolt at the sight. A car mangled beyond recognition lay wrapped around an oak tree, its metal frame contorted into an unnatural sculpture. Emergency services were miles away. Help wasn't coming any time soon. Without hesitation or room for doubt, Ted and I approached the wreckage. The stench was nauseating. It mingled with gasoline, a grim symphony heralding catastrophe. No survivors materialized among the debris. Caller after caller frantically relayed information to 911 operators as they stumbled upon our grim discovery. Meanwhile, Ted and I combed through vegetation for any sign of life, if fate had spared someone from the claws of death tonight. Then it happened. The air tinged with danger when he appeared from beyond our line of sight an unassuming man smeared with blood not entirely his own. Moonlight caught on something metallic glinting in his hand. What followed seemed choreographed in slow motion, a collective intake of breath from those circled around. The figure stood silent amidst our gasps and whispers, his intentions unreadable against our palpable fear. We should wait inside. Someone murmured, a statement laced with an underlying plea for safety, a rationale unchallenged by those present. Retreating into the diner felt like cowering yet stood as our only remaining sanctuary against whatever horrors lurked outside. Ted barricaded us in with methodical precision, the tension carving deep furrows upon weather-beaten faces all around me. Those moments morphed into eternities— we huddled together within the flickering light cocooning us from impending doom outside our makeshift stronghold. Voices murmured plans and contingencies punctured by trembling hands and eyes darting toward windows opaque with condensation, a tableau underscored by dread and anticipation of what unfathomable actions may unfold next within this most desolate backdrop. We stayed silent. Eyes fixed on the space between the blinds, we watched for movement, for signs of what might come next. The man had cuts across his face, his clothing torn. The weapon he gripped was unmistakable in its intention. He moved closer to the diner's entrance. We knew then we wouldn't be leaving any time soon. Ted whispered about calling the police, but his phone showed no service. Panic gripped us as we realized none of us could call out. Too far from town, cellular signals here were a gamble on the best of days. The intruder reached the door and started banging. Each thud against the wood was an echo of our accelerated heartbeats. The old lock and piled furniture were all that stood between us and him. Jim made a dash for the kitchen, looking for something, anything that could help. He returned with a cleaver hands firm around the handle but understanding clear in all our eyes, he wasn't a fighter. Time passed, how much, it was impossible to say. The banging continued then stopped altogether as sirens wailed in the distance. Relief was short-lived, through grim windows, we saw he had set fire to Ted's car. We choked on smoke as it began to seep into the diner. Decision forced upon us, we broke a window at the back and clambered out one by one onto cold ground. The flames cast long shadows as we fled into open fields behind the diner. No direction offered more hope than another but away from fire and man with bloody intent was enough for now. Sirens grew louder until red and blue lights cut through smoke and darkness. We watched from afar as officers surveyed the scene, diner ablaze, our possessions turned to ash inside. They found him later, hidden in nearby woods, 
the man with no name etched upon our memories who brought terror to our doorstep purely for chaos' sake. They said there had been a fight at a bar upstate. That's probably where he got those marks on his face before he came here looking for more trouble. As smoke settled and dawn approached, we sat wrapped in blankets provided by paramedics ignoring question after question because answers didn't matter. All we wanted was to forget, to go home if home still meant anywhere safe and mundane after tonight's brush with unfathomable danger without reason or warning. We remembered Carla from two booths over didn't make it out when we scattered. Her name joins countless others taken too soon by madness they never saw coming. Another casualty of unpredicted violence in quiet places meant for respite not ruin. A sun rose on another day as if nothing had happened. They always do. But those who survived carried weight invisible but immense. Knowledge that safety is delicate and fleeting when least expected, it can shatter in hands unforeseen leaving nothing but survival and stories too real for comfort. It's not every day that your belief in the impossible gets challenged. Well, not unless your job involves dabbling with the very threads of life. That's what I do, or rather, what I did until things took a turn for the surreal. I worked at a secluded facility nestled deep within the forests of the Pacific Northwest, far from prying eyes. This is where the U.S. government conducted secret genetic experiments— and my name is Emmerich Lowry. My life was a cycle of strict routines and protocols until that chilly morning when my colleague, Dr. Quintina Vogel, rushed into the lab out of breath. Droplets of sweat formed a stark contrast on her pale skin as she managed to whisper, Something's gone wrong with Subject E57. It's gruesome. The facility went on immediate lockdown. An emergency meeting convened in the central hub. My team, consisting of Dr. Vogel, our security head Marcellus Hinder, and I gathered around flickering screens that displayed a horrid sight subject E-57 was no longer in its containment unit. Whatever it was now was something else entirely, its form reminiscent of a Wendigo from Native American folklore only with bone structures protruding like makeshift armor. As we debated our next move with growing apprehension, joking half-heartedly about needing the pay rise this kind of situation should warrant alarms blared and radio, chatter became frantic. Security personnel were reporting something large moving through the corridors. Chaos erupted when Marcellus received confirmation via radio that two guards had been found or what was left of them. It wasn't pretty. Their remains painted a picture of marauding brutality I'd only seen in crime scene photos. We knew we had to act quickly and arm ourselves. Rifles were distributed as we set out on what felt like a hunt more than a containment procedure. Yet none of us truly understood the nature of what we were dealing with. We split up into teams, Marcellus leading one while Dr. Vogel insisted on joining me. Strength in numbers, she said, her voice trying to mask the fear we all shared. We're scientists, not soldiers. Quintina quipped as we checked our weapons once more before delving into the dimly lit corridors. Maybe today we're both. I retorted with an attempt at light-heartedness that fell flat in the sterile air. Moving cautiously through our own workspace now felt alien and threatening. This place that had been familiar for so long instantly transformed by this unforeseen horror loosed amongst us. Every shadow made us jumpy. Every sound was magnified until it seemed even our own breaths echoed like distant drumbeats throughout the expanse of tree-shrouded halls bleached by sterile light. Then all pretense of civilization vanished when we rounded a corner to find it. This creature born from our tampering— mutilating another victim in the cold glow of fluorescent lights. The scene tugged at my stomach and twisted it into knots. 
eyes wild and reflecting some unholy hunger. It appeared almost human if not for disproportionate limbs that ended in sharp jagged points like nature's mishandled sculpting tools. The blood stains on its chest could have been war paint, heralding its triumph over mankind's arrogance. Quintina and I froze. The creature looked at us with a sense that it recognized our presence as a threat. We couldn't fight what we didn't understand, and this thing before us was beyond comprehension. Back, I whispered, each word an effort to push out. We retreated, stepping over debris, our minds racing for escape routes. The creature, lost in its grotesque indulgence, paid no heed to the sound of our cautious steps. We reached the lab and barricaded the door. Quintina glanced at the phone, then at me. Signal's dead, she said, her voice strained under the weight of our predicament. The lab was a dead end, a place of research and progress, now a potential tomb. Quintina moved to the cabinets, looking for anything useful. Our eyes met for a brief moment. No words were needed. The creature's shadow snaked into the room under the door crack. It was looking for more. Its silhouette seemed larger now, thicker limbs, sharper angles. I thought of calling out, screaming for someone to hear us, but realized that we hadn't seen any of our colleagues since. Since when? Time had become a blur of fear and flight. Quintina handed me a fire extinguisher, the only weapon we had against an inhuman force. We waited as the scratching on the other side grew frantic. Then it ceased suddenly. Moments stretched, either of us daring to breathe too loud lest we attract attention again. With nothing but seconds ticking by, we made a decision. Quintina nodded toward the ventilation ducts. We removed the heavy metal grate and climbed through the narrow paths, emerging into another section away from our pursuer. Days passed as we hid and moved through our transformed workplace. We found ourselves in a server room on what could have been day three or five. Each moment felt indistinct from the last. The power flickered. The creature had damaged essential systems during its relentless search for prey. Mere survival kept us one step ahead of it, but every space we entered held an imprint of its presence dismembered limbs or half-devoured remains. Since escape was not an option, Quintina suggested that we climb again into another set of ducts leading up towards maintenance access panels on the roof. It became clear to us, no one else was alive here to hear our cries for help. When we reached the roof, rescue greeted us in the form of helicopter searchlights scanning over this facility thrown into darkness amidst power failures, an island held captive by this aberration. Rescue teams secured us with harnesses while one brave soul asked what had happened inside with a trembling voice that betrayed their dread of knowing too much. We don't know. I replied honestly as I looked over at Quintina who wore an identical expression of haunted ignorance. As we ascended away from that hellish sight below us, I realized then that there were things people were never meant to tamper with, that some curiosities leave scars deeper than physical injuries. The only marker for those lost within that place was silence, a void where vibrant life should have been and in my mind would linger those hopeful faces unaware of their fate at the hands, an appetite of something unknown and fierce birth from human error. This happened to me a long time ago. I guess maybe ten years back now. Me and my buddy Kellen spent most summers fishing, hiking, or camping out somewhere along the Pacific coast. We both grew up on the shores of Southern California, and you'd be hard-pressed to find two guys more in love with the open wilderness. Back then, I had an interest in photography, just messing around, nothing serious. Kellen knew that. So, 
when he decided to head up the coast and try out a new, secluded stretch of the Olympic National Park in Washington State. He asked me to come along and document the beauty. Naturally, I jumped at the chance. One sunny morning, we packed up my old RV. It was nothing fancy, but it made those cross-country adventures a whole lot more comfortable. It wasn't exactly an off-road beast, but with Kellen behind the wheel, we had faith. After driving north across the Oregon state line, we turned west, venturing away from the paved highway onto a less certain path. The further along those dirt roads we got, the denser the forest became. Massive fir trees towered over the RV on both sides, their thick canopy almost entirely blotting out the sun. An occasional logging road wound off here and there, but we stayed the course on the wider, unpaved track. As much as I loved the woods, my gut was sending off signals telling me we were straying a bit too far from civilization. We eventually did find a place to pull over, barely any wider than the RV itself. There was a tiny creek running nearby, making it about as idyllic of a spot as we could have hoped for. The first day went off without a hitch. We took a short hike down a nearby trail that had seen significantly more foot traffic than our makeshift road in. Snapped a few shots at sunset, roasted some hot dogs over a crackling fire. Pretty classic first day for one of our trips. It had been so long since we had a summer to indulge in these wilderness escapes, so we savored it. Morning came just as we hoped it would, serene, the air clear and crisp with the faint smell of pine. After a quick breakfast, I grabbed my camera bag and Kellen shouldered his fishing gear. It was time to make good on our adventure. My plan was to wander about, photographing whatever sparked my interest while my buddy tried his luck in the creek. We figured two hours tops before meeting back at the RV for lunch. For quite a while, it was smooth sailing. I found plenty of fascinating fungi to photograph along the banks of the creek. Moss hung low from massive trunks in a dazzling show of nature's handiwork. Even just wandering in aimless loops around our campsite presented captivating visuals. I'd been so caught up I only vaguely noticed time passing. A glance at my watch jolted me. We'd been apart far longer than anticipated. Concerned about Kellen, I started hollering his name, hoping like how my voice would carry through the thick trees. No answer. I pushed the unease down and began heading toward the sound of the creek, figuring he must have just lost track of time chasing trout upstream. That's when I saw the first sign something was terribly wrong. I stumbled upon one of Kellen's fishing rods. It lay snagged in some foliage right on the path. My unease blossomed into full-blown dread. He wouldn't just leave his gear behind. Kellen was a bit of a fanatic, taking meticulous care of all his outdoor equipment. I called out again, this time adding in a bit about finding his rod. Still nothing. I took a deep breath, trying to keep a level head. Accidents weren't impossible, after all. Maybe he fell and banged his head? Sprained an ankle? With those possibilities dancing through my mind, I sprinted in the direction of the creek, praying Kellen had taken an unfortunate spill but nothing worse. I crashed through the trees, following the familiar gurgle of the running water. It was hard to tell how far I'd gone. Panic and adrenaline pumped through me, distorting my perception of time and distance. And then, there it was. An open stretch of ground lay right on the creek bank. Not wide, no more than about fifteen feet across. A few old fishing spots could be made out near the water's edge where trampled grass clung to the muddy earth. It looked like somewhere folks might go to cast a line from time to time. Nothing extraordinary. Nothing, unless you took in the whole scene. There, splayed amongst the dirt, bits of fabric. 
Kellen's neon green t-shirt hung half in and half out of the creek, snagged on a jutting rock, the bottom hem stained a deep, dark red. I recognized the shirt instantly. He'd only pack the one. Just a few feet away, trampled into the ground, were Kellen's sunglasses and hat. Scattered about, I could only pick out small items. Bits of metal. Pieces of plastic that may have been part of a pocket knife. And more cloth. Too much cloth. Kellen was gone. And from the looks of things, he hadn't left willingly. I barely felt my knees give way as I staggered back into the undergrowth. Something wasn't right. Nothing felt right about this. Every bit of my being screamed it. No bear, cougar, or other forest-dwelling predator would attack like this. It all seemed planned, methodical, even. Something out there, some person, had snatched my friend. But why? This thought sent a fresh wave of sickening fear coursing through me. If they'd gone after Kellen with those intentions, it wouldn't be long before they got wind of me. I had to get out of there. There was a ranger station. I couldn't be all that far from the trailhead. Surely someone could help. Turning blindly, I broke into a desperate run back towards the sound of the creek. It became a guide, a way forward from the horrors I couldn't allow myself to dwell on. My lungs burned, each desperate gasp mingling with sobs threatening to burst. Every twisted root in my path held the potential for me to go face first into the tangled ground. Every snap of a twig sent a fresh stab of panic through me. Then, a sound that wasn't natural. Something big, moving through the brush ahead. A figure stepped out, blocking my path, and my body came to a shuddering halt. He was immense, easily seven feet tall though hunched over in a posture that would be impossible for most men. His clothes were ragged, patched together in a mismatch of browns and rough denim. An old hunter's cap crowned his head, greasy strands of his dark hair peeking out at odd angles. But that wasn't what registered most immediately. No, it was the weathered leather, stretched, twisted, and formed into a mask covering his entire face. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but warped contours and tanned hide. I couldn't breathe. Could barely scream. Just stared in abject terror. Suddenly, he lunged. I turned with a strangled cry, legs finally taking action after the initial fear froze me in place. Every sound magnified now, the crunch of damp leaves under my pounding feet, the whistling of my breaths the distant howl of a dog back toward the road. He followed close behind, the gap never seeming to widen. With some burst of animal energy, I managed to reach the road and scramble into the driver's seat of the RV. He appeared as suddenly as I felt the keys drop from my fingers and clatter behind a pedal. His hulking frame was practically pressed against the window as I tried to fumble for the ignition. Finally, the engine whined to life. Slamming the RV into drive, I stomped the gas, a desperate lurch merely sending me careening into the dense forest on the other side of the road. That summer ended forever in that single moment. A few summers ago, not sure exactly how many, I decided to finally do it. Pack up and drive across the country. I always talked about it, romantic notions of the open road, Kerouac on repeat, all that beatnik junk that fills the heads of twenty-somethings with wanderlust. Now, stuck in a cubicle, that dream looked dusty and faded. This trip, maybe it was my last chance. See, at a certain point, life starts throwing anchors down, job, bills, a girl whose eyes linger a little too long on those bridal magazines while you try to feign interest in the sports section. My name's Finn, by the way. 
Not exactly a road warrior handle, but hey, my old man had a thing for Irish folklore. Stuck with me. Back then, I lived in Jersey, but I wasn't about to spend weeks cruising Route 80. Nope, the plan was north, far north. Ever since I discovered those nature documentaries in college, my head filled with images of endless forests, mountains piercing the sky, maybe even a bear or two lumbering along. Maine seemed perfect. The first week was glorious. My battered Honda chugged its way through green tunnels of trees, past quaint towns, with diners promising. World famous. Pie on cracked wooden signs. Then the wilderness opened up. I remember driving into Baxter State Park, the road flanked by pine trees scraping the underbelly of a gray sky. My first night of camping was, let's just say an experiment. Rain pounded the tent. Wind rattled the nylon thin enough to see the lightning flashes, and every snap of a twig in the darkness swore it was a moose about to flatten me. It was a testament to sheer will that I made it through till dawn. After that shaky start, things got better. Days blurred into a routine. Wake up, pack up, hike, fish, badly, make a campfire, sleep, rinse and repeat. Cell service dwindled into oblivion. No bars meant no work emails, no news updates, no mind-numbing social media scroll. Honestly, that might have been the most therapeutic part. Just me, the woods, and my increasingly unkempt beard. Now, a week in, I was feeling bolder. There's a reason that park is called. Katidin Woods and Waters. Trails wound around lakes up rocky outcroppings, everything untouched and primeval. One day, a narrow path took a sharp turn away from a lake. An offshoot, not a proper trail, barely more than a deer track disappearing into thicker trees. Normally, I would have skipped it. Stick to the map, all that safety-conscious drivel. But something that day, the wildness of the place— the silence seeping into my bones made me step off the known path. The way grew less distinct, but I could tell the ground sloped upward. Through the canopy, I caught glimpses of a gray peak breaking the sea of green. I wanted to get higher, see further, be the tiny human dot lost in this ancient panorama. It's funny, now I can't recall any hesitation. No creeping sense of unease. Maybe the city boy had already been shed, replaced by some woodsman instinct long buried in my DNA. What I do remember is the clearing, a wide circle of flattened soil and broken branches, surrounded by a towering wall of pines. I stepped in, and that's when I smelled it. Decay, but not the ordinary rot of fallen leaves. It hung heavy in the still air, an almost sickly sweetness mixed with something, musky. I scanned the clearing, eyes bouncing from tree to tree, looking for the source. At first, I didn't even register the shape lurking under the shadowed tangle of roots at the clearing's edge. Then it moved, rising slow, impossibly tall, and my brain stumbled against the absurdity. Two legs, but stooped awkwardly, limbs ending in long, knobby fingers. For coarse, patchy, dark clung to its massive body. The face, that's what haunts me. Like a human but twisted, warped. The nose flat and broad, lips peeling back from yellow teeth in a snarl. Yellow eyes gleamed from deep sockets, locked onto mine. Its chest heaved, each ragged breath rumbling out like a growl. The name Bigfoot flitted through my mind, almost comical in its inadequacy. My limbs refused to move. I wasn't scared, not exactly. It was more like my brain short-circuited, overwhelmed by the impossibility staring back at me. With another rumbling growl, the thing lunged. It covered half the clearing in a horrifying blink of an eye. Just before it collided with me, 
some survival instinct finally kicked in. A desperate sideways dive, pain exploding in my shoulder as I slammed into the dirt. Then I was scrambling, up and running with no clear direction, no semblance of a plan. It thrashed behind me, smashing through underbrush. Panic turned my steps into a wild lurching stumble. Branches lashed at my face, rocks twisted under my feet. I could hear the creature gaining, its rasping breaths, the shattering of twigs. Just when I thought it was going to grab me, a sudden break in the trees a dirt track. In my mindless flight, I'd somehow stumbled upon a real road. I burst out of the undergrowth and froze, panting. Whatever followed had hesitated, keeping to the thick cover. I stood there, heart drumming so loud I almost missed the faint sound of an approaching motor. A muddy pickup truck sputtered around the bend. From the driver's bewildered stare, I must have looked a sight, torn clothes, covered in grime, probably raving wild-eyed. I managed to gasp out something resembling a plea for help, and by some stroke of pure luck, he didn't pull away or ask too many questions. Just got me bundled into the truck and called the ranger station. They arrived a while later, two park rangers in crisp uniforms. I stumbled through my rambling story, but I could tell their skepticism. Even to my own ears it sounded insane. Their search turned up nothing, no footprints bigger than a size 14, no trampled undergrowth, nothing to verify my claims. I stuck to my story, though maybe less conviction seeped into each retelling. The rangers exchanged uneasy glances but gave the obligatory safety speech about staying on marked trails and leave no trace principles. My battered Honda was still at the trailhead. With an odd mix of dread and relief, I started the long drive home. I never found anything that remotely corroborated what I saw. No missing person reports, no hushed whispers among hikers. Some nights, after too much to drink, I'll search online, grainy Bigfoot photos, forum threads full of crackpot theories. They just make me doubt myself even more. Was it a hiker in some homemade creature costume? A drug-fueled hallucination wouldn't be the first time in those woods. But then I remember those eyes, that inhuman face, not cruel, but devoid of empathy or recognition. That I can't explain away. Maybe I truly was an outsider peering into a realm I wasn't meant to see. I didn't go back to Maine, haven't been camping since. That sense of wonder I sought? Gone, replaced by something uneasy lurking in the back of my mind. Life back in civilization went on, just like I knew it would. The job, the bills, and yeah, a girl who might just wear an off-white dress someday. The pull of the wild is still there, but fainter now. Sometimes, on walks after work, when the shadows between the trees deepen, I'll shiver almost expecting a pair of yellow eyes to gleam back at me, just for a moment.